Scope, a podcast of two guys in their 20s, giving their respect on the games that we love, the headlines of pop culture, and the meaning behind it all. I'm host Wenza Burns, and my kind of our save on Morris was not able to be on for this one, but I'm joined by two familiar guests. The, the, the last time they were on, we, 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 we went a lot longer than we were expecting, but first, Micaiah Albert, president of, of Chiefs, Chiefs Fan Club. How's it going, man? <laughs> it's going really, really well, Wellington. Uh, I'm not sure president of Chiefs Fan Club. That's a, <laughs> that's a high title. I think Paul Rudd uh, might take Already, a little bit of offense. That. Henry, be mad at that, Henry, Henry Winkler. I, I don't know, man. There's some there's some big names out there that are Love some big Paul Rudd on the show. But <laughs> I, for sure, that would be great. But I'm happy to uh, represent Chiefs Kingdom on this podcast. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, and, and our second guest, Mr. Greg O'Battles, has been on countless times in the past. And thanks so much for being back on, sir. I appreciate you having me this morning, sir. I'm looking forward to it. Always a good time and uh, enjoy speaking with you fellas. Yeah, definitely. And for this episode, we have a lot of topics to get into. Um, and for the first half, we're, we're going to do some, obviously, some, a Super Bowl preview um, and, and some NBA topics. But to start off with, with the, the Chiefs-Eagles Super Bowl preview, um, you know, looking at this matchup, there, there's obviously different circulating elements that the Chiefs pass rush um, um, ha- has improved. And both teams have had experience in different shootouts for the season. And when I look at Philadelphia, I mean, they obviously have been dominant for most of the year, but they, when you look at the teams they faced, the Giants, Daniel Jones, and then San Francisco losing both their quarterbacks, and now they're having to face, you know, the best quarterback in the league, it's, it's definitely going to be an adjustment for them, even though they've had a dominant season. Uh, to, to you, Micaiah, like, how do you, what do you think about this matchup? Um, just the different X factors in it and what will, will really decide this matchup? Yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good game, I believe. Two great teams. Um, the Eagles, obviously, a very complete team. Yeah. Um, so much to the point where you were getting talk of, uh, you know, in the MVP race, whether it was fair or not. You know, if you just pull Jalen Hurts off, could any other decent quarterback win with that team? That's just how complete a team. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but that's the talk that was going around about how complete this team was in right. all facets, in all areas, um, offensive line running backs, wide receiving core, uh, even tight ends are really good. Um, and then the, the defense is just loaded. It's basically all SEC guys running around there. It's almost like someone just took all the best SEC draft picks and just oh, put, picked them all together and put it on that defense. So <laughs> some really good picks. Um, so, But you kind of stole my thunder, Wellington. Um, the, the X factor in terms of why you can't just bury the Chiefs, one is because Patrick Mahomes is on the other side. Far and away the best quarterback in the game right now. I don't think that's a, I don't think it's a debate. I don't think any of us would debate that that he's hands down the best quarterback in the league yeah. right now today. Um, so that's factor number one. That's the best quarterback you are going to have faced all year. You said Daniel Jones, Dak yeah. Prescott. You know um, whatever you want to think of Dak and his struggles throughout the season. He did get him once. Um, but that was when they were without Jalen. So, but they did face as a collective team. They did face Dak yeah. a couple times. Um, and let's see some other quarterbacks. Uh, they did face Aaron Rodgers, who was a good quarterback, and um, a few other ones, but really no major blue chip names out there And as when it comes to quarterbacks. So it's going to be interesting to see how this Philly defense responds sometimes to, to a top-flight quarterback. Um, I think I saw a graphic the other day that when they went up against those bigger names, so that deck, that, that your Dak Prescotts, your Aaron Rodgers, the defense gave up 30 plus when they went up against top tier quarterbacks. So this, this Philly defense, it, you can score on them. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. It's going to be a very knockdown, drag them out at times. They're going to get their stops. They're going to get their pressure. Yeah. But when you see where Philly has been able to have success, at least in the postseason, is when they can just let those pass rushers cut loose and pin their ears back and go after the quarterback. Why is that? Because the quarterback is either one inexperienced or young or they're able to take advantage of the opposing team's offensive line. Those are two things that I think they're, they're going to struggle a little bit against the Chiefs. Uh, again, they will have successes against the Chiefs' offensive line. The Chiefs' offensive line by no means is the best in the league. I would give that probably to Philly um, from what we've seen so far. But it is a serviceable offensive line. The Chiefs, after the loss to the Bucks in the Super Bowl a couple years ago, made it a key point to make sure that Patrick Mahomes was not going to be that beat up again. Running for so his life. really retooled. Yeah, running for his life, man. I think it was yeah. like something like 700 yards in cumulative scrambling, like laterally, backwards, and forwards. It was something yeah. like something insane, like 700-plus yards. Um, mm-hmm. So they wanted to make sure that never happened. And then, too, like I said, it's Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is going to make the right read. Patrick Mahomes is going to find the open man. And so that Philly defense is going to have to basically limit him. I think 
it's going to be interesting because everyone says you want to keep Mahomes in the pocket, but if you look at his statistical numbers, he's actually better from the pocket. From the pocket, when he makes, when you force him to stay in the pocket, I think he's more sound fundamentally. He's not as exciting. He's not what we think of as Patrick Mahomes when he's not right. scrambling out of the pocket making magic happens. But he's so sound fundamentally in getting the ball out quick. That's where he's developed this year, and that's where he's become more dangerous and more lethal as a passer. Is he's making those quick reads. So that's where I think we're going to see in terms of Chiefs versus def- uh, Eagles defense matchup, the other side of the ball uh, for the Chiefs. The Chiefs have really developed a good pass rush. They were second this year in passes batted down and in terms of collective pressure, not in sacks, although I think they were second in sacks as well, but in collective pressure, knockdowns, hits, everything collectively. They were second all year in the entire league in pressure. Yeah. Um, so the Chiefs can get there. Now, it'll be interesting to see how consistently they can get there against this Philly offensive line because it is so great and so good. As a Chiefs fan, what I would like – this is – let's just take even the Chiefs fan out of it. What I think from a football standpoint they need to do, you have to pick your poison. You cannot let Philly run the ball. I heard someone say that they didn't think earlier this week that Philly was fundamentally a running team. I just disagree wholeheartedly with that. When you're in third and short, fourth and one, and you're lining up in a rugby rugby scrum formation, you are a smash mouth football team, and that's who you are. Your core. So it's so basically, if you're a Chiefs defense, I think Spags has to make him throw for two reasons. One, you can't let the run game let them win the time of possession and keep your star quarterback on the sidelines. If they throw a seventy yard bomb for a touchdown. You live with it, and you live to fight another day, and hopefully that doesn't happen again because then, you know what, Patrick Mahomes comes right back out on the field, and they scored in, you know, a minute or less. And they're not on these long six, seven, eight-minute drives that are keeping Patrick Mahomes on the sidelines. The other reason is Jalen is a little banged up. The The story coming into this game was yeah. Patrick Mahomes' high ankle sprain and how well he was going to be. I don't know if you guys know this. Can't overlook her injury. No, Jalen was not himself in the San Francisco game. He didn't have to throw was the thing in San Francisco from that injury that he'd suffered in the regular season because they buried them so early. And basically San Francisco didn't have a guy who could throw it past the line of scrimmage. So, I mean, they just turned into, we're going to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And there'll be a couple times where we'll ask Jalen to to pass it. If the Chiefs make Jalen pass it, it's going to be interesting to see if Jalen can beat him, I think that Jalen is more than ca- capable as a passer. But if yeah. he is limited at all with this injury, it's going to be interesting to see. Can he hit the deep ball? Can he hit those timing throws? Is he going to be able to get the ball to his playmakers that will hopefully burn the Chiefs? The other conversation is going to be this Chief is this Chiefs defense is very young on the back end. And so that's the other reason where you're going to have to force him to test those young guys. The Chiefs traded away Tyree Kill. They traded away veteran pieces on the defensive back end. Because they wanted to get these rookies playing time because they wanted them to be ready for this moment. And I think if we go back to the Cincy game, um, I know we're on Chiefs-Eagles, but if you go back to the Cincy game, they held up really well. And you can say that that was because Cincy's offensive line was in shambles and so they were able to get pressure. When you looked at what Spags did to scheme them uh, and bracket Jamar Chase, those young guys did a really good job against an elite, probably the best wide receiving core in the league. I don't know if either of you would take issue with that. I don't think many people would. There might be a little bit of a debate, but when you're talking about Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and then um, Hayden Hurst, even as their tight end, that is a lethal receiving core. And the Chiefs really did a good job about, about limiting them, limiting the big plays. So I'm interested to see if the Chiefs defense can get the pressure on Jalen and if Spags is going to make him throw. Because I think as the Chiefs, you have to pick your poison and you cannot let this Philly team run the ball on you. So those yeah. are what I think are kind of the keys to victory for both sides. Definitely. Um, and, and for you, Mr. Greco, like what are your initial thoughts on this matchup and just kind of like what could be the overall deciding factor in it? Well, it's like he read my notes here, went right down my script. <laughs> <laughs> in his analysis and what have you. Um, but I will but I will agree with him and I'll just kind of add a couple extra points if I may. Uh, I think that Philly, you know, their offensive line, the defensive line, fantastic. I think as a team, uh, they're probably a better all-around, more talented team, okay? However, 100% agree. I, uh, I still think that the determining factor are the things that the Chiefs have, okay? Andy Reid, Mahomes, uh, they're the best at making adjustments. They'll go in here and play this game. Um, uh, 
everybody knows that they're wide receiver problems. They've got problems with wide receivers. And that's the only thing that kind of concerns me. However, they've had a couple of weeks to get healthy, okay? And to help them get, have a little more experience, that band skilling and uh, Juju's going to be coming back. Uh, those are going to be pluses for them. Uh, Travis Kelsey, I mean, what can you say about him? I mean, they're going to be they're going to be all over him. But I guarantee you, Andy Reid's going to have a scheme where Kelsey goes out to the wide receiver. They play double tight ends, something of that of that nature, so that frees him up. Kelsey's still going to get eight catches, 100 yards, at least. That. You know, I don't care what they do to him. Okay, <laughs> um, but one of the biggest factors I'm also looking at, uh, uh, along with what uh, Mr. McKay had had mentioned, was the fact that. That injury bug is really, really important. I was looking at it just this morning just to make sure. And if you look at the injury list, it's like who was available for practice and things like that. Mm -hmm. Several of Philly's players were very, very limited in practice all the way up to yesterday. Uh, as I look at it, it was about uh, at least five offensive linemen who were banged up or limited in some fa fashion. They've got about three or four defensive, uh, defensive linemen that are banged up. And, of course, this time of year, everybody's banged up. But, I mean, yeah. these guys are in yeah. serious, have some serious, you know, the groins, the shoulders. Different type of injury. Different, different types of injuries. Yeah. And I do believe it's going to show up in this game. Uh, I think uh, you saw a lot of it in uh, in the San Francisco game with Philly. Okay? Yeah, I know San Francisco won, uh, lost that game 31-7, to but we also know that what the circumstances were there. Okay? Yeah. I was uh, impressed how – San Francisco's defense, though, really kind of overall kept them in, in check. Mm -hmm. And I can see Kansas City doing the same thing. There's a lot of weaknesses in that uh, on that offensive line, okay? But with that being said, I still think Philly's got, their goal is going to be out to get that ball and, and, and run that ball. Miles Sanders, top threat. Uh, and he's even losing time to this other kid. This was named Gainwell, the other running back. Yep. He's really yeah. come on for them real strong. So I look for them to definitely try to control it with the run. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kansas City's going to give up some yards on the on the ground. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Okay, but I would uh, I would go ahead. That's to me. I don't think that's as a bigger problem. Uh, Jalen Hurts, very competent quarterback, very skilled quarterback, and what have you. However, I would still try to put the game in his hands if I'm Kansas City. I'm trying to get a lead. And make Philly play out, by, you know, down seven, down ten, going into the fourth quarter. Let Jalen Hurts see if he can beat you. Okay, that run pass option, yeah, that looks real nice during the season. Um, but I don't know so much with 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 Kansas City, uh, especially with his physical condition. I really do believe he's got some physical limitations also. Uh, even healthy, Jalen Hurts is an excellent quarterback. But again, I still think he has his limitations. He doesn't really like to go that. He's more of a safe quarterback than he is in a, a risk taker. Right. And when you're playing, yeah. you know, he mentioned uh, th their schedule. Uh, if you look at their schedule, man, it really, really wasn't a, a very strong sp uh, schedule, especially if you look at the last 10 games of the season. Heck, they, they beat three New York Giants three times in those 10 games <laughs> at the end of the season, okay? This team just uh, hasn't been tested to right. me. Like that's I'm that's sorry. the number. This team just really hasn't been tested as much in they certain really aspects. They really, really haven't been tested. While they've got some very uh, solid uh, pros, very uh, solid veterans, a lot of them are not experienced in the big game. Right. And I, that, I think that's going to concern me. Uh, Philly's wide receivers are good. You know, AJ Brown. He's on the. He was on the injured list. Didn't hardly practice this week. Now I'm a little nervous about the kid Devontae Smith. I really uh, I respect his skills and his talent. I think they're going to try to utilize him a lot. But I just don't think that Philly has the overall star power to make a difference in, in, in this Super Bowl, okay? Uh, if, if, if Kansas City can limit their mistakes, keep the turnovers down, and if it's going to be a close, because I think it's going to be a low-scoring, close game, a good old-fashioned, hard-hitting, defensive game. Uh, Patrick Mahomes will be somewhat limited with that ankle, but he's smart, man. I think they're going to use utilize those running backs, Cheo, I think that kid's got a lot of potential. I can see him coming out of the backfield on a lot of uh, dump-off passes all across the middle. Because let's face it, they're going to double-team Kelsey everywhere he goes. Yeah. I don't think the wide yeah. receivers are – I think their defensive back can handle their wide receivers one-on-one, -on -one, okay? I think most of the time that's going to be at least a 50-50 toss-up right there. So they're going to have to go to those – dump it to those backs. The other running back, Clyde uh, – what's his name? Edwards? Bel Air yeah. Edwards? Yeah, Edwards. He'll be back. 
So that gives them another weapon on that off for, for that offense. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how uh, what kind of game plan Andy Reid has. Turnovers are going to be a key. I think I favor the only place I really favor Kansas City. I would think is in the kicking game. Uh, San Francisco's, uh, I mean, uh, Kansas City's kickers. I mean, he's done 62 yards this year, while uh, uh, Philly's kickers has a little better percentage. I think uh, Kansas City kicker has been tested more. And then their punter, man, he's people don't talk about that punting game, but that punter averages over 45 y- punt, yards of punt. And when they get in trouble, he gets some. Uh, he gets that field control. Uh, 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 you know where he can kick the ball and, and control, and they can control the field. You know, they limit right. the field, field position. Make it on the drive, which has to make it go in those off possessions. So I just think it's a, a good, tough game. Um, I'm, I'm favoring Philly. I know most of the experts and the betters all are saying Philly and by a point and a half or whatever they're talking about. Right. But I think the experience of, uh, of uh, Mahomes, I think they've, uh, they're on a – Kansas City's on a mission. Uh, sometimes in history, you know, you've just got those individuals this was those, some of those, uh, their go-to games, if you will, a must game. I think this is going to be kind of a defining moment for uh, Mahomes. I'm MVP. I'm hurt. And this is just a time for me to shine and look really, you know, look like a really superstar by pulling this game out and doing some kind of magic. So, um, you know, I'm really, really uh, looking forward to the game. I, I really think Kansas City has a shot. Uh, I can see uh, Philly getting off to a good start and what have you. But I think during the course of that game, as it gets as it gets become more intense and as it goes along, I can see injuries playing a factor. Some of those guys sitting down, their neck, their back, their groin, just that and the other. Replacements coming in, and I think uh, Kansas City can do that because they they sleep on Kansas City's defense. But at Chris Jones, at Frank Clark, those those, those oh, are they're tough difference players. makers. Yeah, those are tough, and they've been there. Yeah, they've done. It. Yeah. And the rookies, they got a nice, real well blend of rookies. Right. And uh, you cover for him real well. Uh, I know that guy Sneed, he he might be limited for Kansas City, that defensive back. He helps kind of captain them back there. But uh, I, I just like uh, the approach, the, the coaching adjustments that Kansas City can make. And uh, I think that I think they're going to pull it out in the end. I, I see Kansas City winning this in the low score, uh, in the 20s anyway. And, and, that's the, and that's the interesting thing about the conversation because the Chiefs, you know, they, they've won one Super Bowl, but there's a difference between like, winning one and winning multiple like to either either of you like what do you feel as though because this is a this is this could be a this could be a beginning of a dynasty run if, if the Kansas City wins this and, and, and keeps going on because they had that stretch with Tyree Kill now they're in that second window um how do you guys feel about the possibility of um you know what this team can do if they actually win this and keep going on for more Super Bowls well if I go first I would just say uh the sky's the limit. They keep drafting. If you know, they've got a good scouting and drafting uh, department. Yeah. They, they they realize what their pluses and what their minuses are. Okay. So I know that they're going to be looking at picking up a new, you know, a wide receiver, getting some depth in that offensive line. Uh, as long as uh, they're hungry like they are, uh, Mahomes, Kels, uh, uh, Travis Kelsey, uh, those guys want more. They got a little ego. There's a little vanity there. And uh, while they'll never reach the Tom Brady levels, I don't believe, uh, as far as that number of championships, you know, they've got five conference, uh, you know, Western uh, Western finals five times in a row already. Okay. I can see them uh, still being competitive. Cincinnati's going to give them, make some noise, and Buffalo is going to make some noise over the next couple of years. Uh, You know, there's going to be some competition, but I think they're going to be in the mix for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, Mr. Greco said the sky is the limit, and he said he didn't think that he'd reach the Tom Brady level. But, I mean, no one thought Tom Brady was going to reach that level either. So, I mean, it's one of those things where it's unbelievable, (laughs) and we can't believe it until we see it. But no one thought Tom Brady was going to go and win Super seven Super Bowls when they saw that product out there. Like, oh, man, Bill Belichick's defense, and this kid's really good at, you know, making sure that they don't lose any games. And then he just blossomed and bloomed into the player that he did. Listen, even if they lose this game – uh, this is going to sound biased. I think they're already a dynasty. I, I know that we chalk it up to all Super Bowls, but Mi- Mr. Greco said at five straight conference championships, all at Arrowhead too. That's the other thing. They've all been at Arrowhead. So it's like they run the AFC. Yes, since he's going to be there, but since he's going to have to pay Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, and they're going to end up having to probably make some tough decisions about who they're going to keep. Because uh, unless T. Higgins gives them a hometown discount and just wants to keep the band together, T. Higgins is going to be gone out of there. They're not going to be able to keep Hayden Hurst. So while everyone else is going to have to make financial decisions and cut players loose, the Bills, 
the Bengals. And then you saw what all the AFC West did this offseason to try and catch the Chiefs. No one did it. They're, they're back here in the Super Bowl. And what did the Chiefs do? They traded their most dynamic weapon away, and they are back in the Super Bowl yet again. So I think it's a testament to Brett Veach, their general manager, how smart he is. Mr. Greco said it. They are drafting. They, they have hit on almost every single draft pick they have hit. My only personal beef was the Clyde Edwards-Alaire pick. But that was in a year where they didn't really know what to do with that pick. It was like the first, I think it was, that was the year after they won the Super Bowl. It was the first pick of the, it was the 32nd pick of the first round. So the last pick of the first round, you didn't really know what you wanted to do. You didn't have, you'd lost Kareem Hunt. You'd have a bunch of role players at court at running back. So you just wanted to try and get a dynamic, a dynamic pass catching back. And he has just not really fit the scheme of the teams because he just can't really run in between the tackles. So that's why I was really happy this year to get Pacheco. Pacheco, even before Clyde Edwards-Alaire got hurt, took the job from Clyde Edwards-Alaire. He's a physical runner. He is the best that I've seen. I'm not ready to say that he's better than Kareem Hunt because Mahomes did have Kareem Hunt that one year. Right. Uh, his MVP year when he went in 2018, they fell short against the the um the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. But I think that's still probably Mahomes' best running back was Kareem Hunt in terms of running in between the tackles, running outside the tackles, catching the ball, being physical. But Pacheco has the opportunity to become that for Patrick Mahomes if he can use this dynamic up. I think he's probably a little bit more physical of a runner than even Hunt was, but I want to see him to continue to bloom into that pass-catching game. But Ma- like I said, again, biased. I think they're already in the midst of building a dynasty. I think to get that acknowledgement, they do need to win some Super Bowls to start stacking those up. But, I mean, Brady won three in the span of 14 years. I know that we think that, oh, Brady won those three in the span of four years. Well, yeah, but then he didn't win another one for eight more years. They went eight years, and one of those, now they went to the Super Bowl and lost a couple. But one of those years was yeah. the the amazing 16-0 and team with Randy Moss, and they didn't oh. win the Super Bowl. So, I mean, I won them to win the Super Bowl. It will be good for them. It will be more beneficial to Mahomes because that means he will already have had two in the span of his five years of starting, um, two out of three, which will look good. Um, But even if they lose this, Mahomes is going to have a long career. As long as Mahomes and Andy Reid are together, they're going to have a shot. It's like... They're, they're going to be there. I know that everyone – I'm not saying that they're going to get to the Super Bowl every year. That's unrealistic as a, as a fan. But they have the ability with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid to get to the Super Bowl every year. And this year has proved it. Traded away their most dynamic piece. Their own division, Russell Wilson. Chandler Jones to the Raiders. Uh, Devontae Adams to the Raiders. Um, uh, pass rusher for the Chargers. Oh, I can't remember. Um, used to play for the Bears. Um Oh, oh, yeah. Khalil, yeah. Mack. Khalil Mack, Khalil Mack, Khalil Mack to the Chargers, um, and then they added another piece to the Chargers too. Oh, the the um the young DB um from New England. I can't remember his his name escapes me too, but they picked him up. They all loaded up in the division, and Kansas City won all by Thanksgiving. Kansas City had won it, and it was all wrapped up. So it'll be interesting to see. The division is going to get more competitive. I think Sean Payton can do enough to. Uh, I, I still need to see it because Russell Wilson looks just looks like there is something broken with him. But if anyone can fix him, Sean Payton can. So it'll be interesting to see um, the Raiders until they get a QB. It, are they a mess? Um, I think the Chargers will look better with oh, – um, uh, I got a Broncos fan in the background there. <laughs> in front of the Broncos. Um, six wins maybe next year. Yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> um I, I got to be careful what I said. My boss may watch that. My boss is a big Broncos fan, so I don't want right. to get in trouble. Um, uh, but And still it'll be interesting, the division. But I think uh, until further notice, the AFC runs through Arrowhead. Um, yes. And don't, don't ever say Burrowhead again. I don't want to – I know that's going back to the AFC championship. I don't ever want to oh, hear yeah. that again. Bro, d- just don't talk trash until after you've won the game. That is just such a bad idea. I know you're man. heated about that. I know you're heated about uh, that. <laughs> no, I tried. I tried. I prayed to God as Lord. Just let let me keep a good attitude about this. This is such baloney, though, man. This team, this Ohio. What is it with Ohio? The Ohio State. I just Ohioans just like talking trash. I think I don't know what it is, but <laughs> wait a minute now. I don't- I forgot, Mr. Greco's an Ohio State fan. I may be getting hot water. (laughs) You got to be honest, though, Mr. Greco, though. Ohio State fans and Ohio fans, for whatever reason, they like to talk some trash, whatever, for whatever reason it is. And we like to back it up. 
<laughs> yeah, they like that. They do. They got to back this time. They did not back it up. It was not backed up. So, yeah. but um, but, uh, but I know, just think it's going to be really good. Division, I don't think your competition is going to be from your division. I think it's outside of that division. Uh, probably so. Probably so. Cincinnati. I'm not a Cincinnati so. fan. But Cincinnati, Buffalo. Speaking of Ohio, Cleveland is. Uh, I think Deshaun Watson is going to do some good things for Cleveland. Uh, before that's over and said and done, I think that's a yeah. team. They, they weren't really good this year. But I think next year, uh, that's one of those teams that they're not talking about. Look out for those Browns. I think they're 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 ready to make a move next year. So their competition is not going to be within the division. It's mostly going to be outside of the division because Andy Reid's far and away the best coach in that that division. I know Sean Payton's coming in, but uh, we talked great about Sean. They were competitive, but he he had Drew Brees, but all the like quarterback. Andy, yeah, he he doesn't have a he's got and he's just got one championship, and that was back in Katrina. <laughs> So, or, or slightly afterwards. So, you know, uh, they stayed competitive, but as far as actually, you know, uh, I don't I don't see Denver rising right now. Not, not just yet. Not yeah, just and, yet. and to, that go, was another, to go back yeah. to the to go back to the Brady thing real quick in terms of chasing him, I mean, Mahomes has a good shot. Like I know it's again don't it want to sound like it's the him. homer, like it's the Chiefs fan, but let's let's when you look at his numbers. He has reached the AFC Championship every year he has started. That That is, like, all-time great. He His numbers, I know his career has not gone the, the length of the field. We can't fast forward. But as it stands today, he is first in regular season stats. In terms of every significant QB stat you want, he is first in regular season. He is first in postseason stats. He's shattering these records. And if he can just stack up some Super Bowls, I don't think it's outlandish to say he can pass Brady. I know that just sounds so – how it, that's impossible. We've seen – Brady just retired. He's in, It's impossible to pass the GOAT. Like, he's done so much. But when you look at actually Mahomes' numbers, you just, like, just give him time. He's already statistic, statistically on pace to, like, shatter all these records and take them all from Brady that have done statistically. So he's just – to me, it's just going to be about racking up championships because no one's going to say you're close to Brady or you're going to put him in the GOAT conversation if you don't have at least – what's Brady at? He's 7-3 and three in Super Bowls. You're going to have to have, I think, at least four or five to even have a conversation because Montana, you know, people argued with Montana and Brady for a while when Brady had six and then he won that extra one. So I think if you have a ton of statistical records and you have four or five, you don't have to necessarily win as many as Brady did to, to, to catch him. Because if you're statistic, if you shatter all of his records statistically and you have, you know, only two or three less than him, then you're going to have an argument. Now you're going to have the people, you know, in New England who are always going to say that he's a go. There will be some other people, but there will be a legitimate argument. And at this point, it's just going to be, can the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes stack up some championships back it up? And that's why I think it's important to win this one on Sunday so yeah, that Eric. then he can be two and one instead of one and two, and then he's going to have to start catching up the rest of his career. So then he's kind of got that buffer. I'm not saying that he can't continue to win Super Bowls, but he'll have a buffer then because he'll have won two in the span of five years. He'll have that LeBron effect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He won't have as many championships, but they, that helps him get in the conversation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Kelsey, they, they, if they lose Kel, you know, Kelsey's, what, how old is Kelsey now? About 31? Uh, he's 34, 35, somewhere in there. He's, he's, I actually saw this. You guys are going to be mind blown. He is older than Gronk. Okay. Wow. He's okay. older than Gronk, and Gronk has been out of the league, I think, for two years now. He retired two years ago. That's my problem with my, with the thing. If that organization keep that personnel flowing, yeah. Right? Okay. I mean, they did a great job this year losing Hill, but mm -hmm. you can see the, the the difference in the quality of the team and that offense. Man, that Hill was a, he was Big a difference. Uh, game changer. And then Kel and with Kelsey, oh my goodness, they were something. I, I didn't recognize uh, Kansas City. Until a few years ago, I used to think my my pastor in Atlanta, he was the only Kansas City Chief fan I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> and so he suffered. He still was talking about Lynn Dawson. So he suffered all the way up until now. So now he's sitting on top of the world. So <laughs> yeah. he's loving yeah. these, this, this run by the Chiefs right now. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I mentioned um, another topic I had mentioned was, was, you know, with the Bengals and 49ers. They, these were the, you know, last, the, 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 the losers of the conference championships. Um, Cincinnati, I think, you know, with, with Joe Burrow, obviously, like he, even though they didn't win that game, he still had an impressive performance that fourth and six to, to, to Jamar Chase, he was able to keep them in it. Um, and then obviously the Osai penalty just, you know, kind of did them in. 
And then with San Francisco, they have all these amazing skill playmakers, but at, it's always missing the quarterback. That, that's always the, 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 the thing with San Francisco. Like, to, to you, Mr. Greco, like between Cincinnati and San Francisco, which team do you think can kind of get back to that conference championship berth and maybe even further? Uh, between those two teams, I'm going to say Cincinnati, okay? Not because of Ohio bias, because if you're from Ohio, especially mid to northern Ohio, you don't even count Cincinnati as part of the state. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you got to be in Ohio to understand. <laughs> but uh, Cincinnati's got all the pieces. They're growing. They're coming along. The only thing that will mess it up for Cincinnati is the organization themselves. They, right. They're historically sure. a cheap organization. They don't want to pay the money. OK, uh, you got to tow the line or they'll let you go. And that's the thing that concerns me about Cincinnati. Like he had mentioned earlier, you're going to have to pay some of these guys. and You're not going to have the money to pay everybody. OK, and they're already in desperate need of offensive linemen. OK, they got to keep building up on that defense. San Francisco, excellent team. They got a lot of quality uh, personnel over there. Uh, I'm going to say something here that I don't know how many people agree with, but uh, I think the problem with, Cincinnati, uh, with San Francisco's problem is is, is, is some of the coach. is uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, Shanahan. Uh, Shanahan. Uh, Shanahan, I think, is more as a coordinator. I think he's a great offensive coordinator. Uh, but I think that trying to be the head coach might be a, he's, he might be in it a little bit over, a little bit over his head in that category. Uh, and the reason I say that, um, I mean, he's a developer of quarterbacks and things of that nature, but What's been his perennial problem? Quarterbacks, okay? Um, he, he can put in a game plan, but he loses his team. That's one of the reasons when he was when he was in Atlanta. You know, he, was, uh, he wasn't the head coach. He was the offensive coordinator when we had the 28-3 game to New England. 28-3 <laughs> to three in the fourth quarter. We didn't know what I'm talking about. What a memory. Okay. Uh, in the hand, if you let one I'd like to burn. <laughs> you can focus on... Uh, running the offense, mm -hmm. he would be outstanding. Uh, I think trying to do the whole, the whole scheme of things and all that, I think he's kind of a little bit out of uh, out of his element right there. And I, I, I think that shows up, has been showing up over the years. Uh, he's not very decisive. I think part of the quarterback problem is him. Dude, make a decision. Garoppolo is going to be Trey Lance. Now you brought this new kid in, Purdy. You, you're still waffling. Make a decision. This is my quarterback. Let's move forward. Okay. Uh, San Francisco, other problems is they get these flashy guys that, that are really good. My goodness, they're injury prone. I mean, you know, Bosa, exile stater, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the best, man, that dude. But, you know, he only plays a half a season every year. I mean, he's always hurt. You know, McCaffrey, outstanding talent, really, really good player. Injury prone. Debo Samuel, injury prone. Okay. Uh, they've got guys who are really, really good players. But they can't keep can't on, the on the field. field. Yeah. They can't. They just can't stay on the field. Um, and I still see them going forward as having quarterback issues. Uh, I don't know if Trey Lance is ready. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. They said he's not coming back. This Purdy kid looks good, but uh, you know who? What's the, who's to say? They, they, he had a solid squad with him. You know. Uh, so I, 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 if I, just between those two teams, I would have to go with Cincinnati. I would think that they, they right now they're on the path. They're hungry. They're upset. Yeah. And I, I think they're doing it the right way. Absolutely. Makai, to you, between these two teams, um, which one would you say, like, like obviously, like, like Mr. Rico was just mentioning, San Francisco, the injury bug, that's something that they can't get over. Kyle Shanahan, he's been kind of heralded as, like, an offensive mastermind um, by many. But still, like, they, there is there is the concern of, like, can you plug in the right quarterback? And then with Cincinnati, it's got to pay, gotta, gotta pay those surrounding parts and still keep Joe Burrow happy. Yeah. Um, I'm going with San Francisco, um, not because of the, the bias. For, there's, a, there's a separate reason, too, that, I, that I'll get into in a second. Um, let me just talk on San Francisco. Um, I, I can't put the quarterback issues on him. He's been dealt with who he had. They brought in as a GM. They brought in Jimmy Garoppolo, and that's who he had to play with. He got Jimmy G to a Super Bowl, and Jimmy G, you know, for all he's been praised and heralded for, he's not really – that guy he's not I think we probably all three of us agree that he's not the guy that's going to get you over the hump we saw it in the Super Bowl he can't hit Emmanuel Sanders um when it counted so uh that's kind of what cost him the game uh, he had a late turnover I think too that's kind of sealed it for him as well so 
I, he got Jimmy G to a Super Bowl. I, again, the, the the Patriots game, he's got to wear that egg on his face. I do hold him accountable because he got away from running the ball, which got him there. They got too pass happy, and that allowed New England to crawl, crawl back into the game. The Trey Lance thing, again, that was a John Lynch pick, I think, and probably he consulted Shanahan. Trey Lance got hurt the second game of the season when they tried to start him this year. So, again, I don't think you can put that on Shanahan um, as just a freak ACL femur injury that happened to Trey Lance. And then Purdy. He got Purdy all the way to the NFC Championship game, and then Purdy gets knocked out with injury. So, some of this to me this year has just been bad luck. I mean, Mr. Greco, I think, brought up some good points with some of them being injury prone. McCaffrey, now McCaffrey actually stayed healthy this year. McCaffrey was not injury prone this year, but he does have that history. So I will give you that. Uh, Debo is also injury prone. Nick Bosa, you mentioned. Okay, my only thing with Nick Bosa is Nick Bosa was defensive player of the year. And if he only plays half of a season and he's still defensive player of the year, I will sign up for that half of a season. So I will live and die with that injury bug if that's Nick Bosa's problem. Um, They've got Fred Warner who is the best linebacker in the country, super smart. And they've got Dre Greenlow running right – or Dre Greenlaw, excuse me, running right now is his running partner, who is a fantastic um, linebacker in his own right. I think um, – I can't remember his name, but they have a really good safety. Um, they Again, defense is so underrated in today's game. And San Francisco, to me, no disrespect to Philly, I think San Francisco has the best defense in the league when they are healthy. Um just top to bottom. Um, Cause I think Philly's one weakness is their linebackers. I don't know their linebackers as well. They're solid, but they're not Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw. So um, they lost. Their I, coordinator, though. Yeah, they did. Lot of, so it will be interesting, but they, but again, yeah. they lost their coordinator last year. Robert Sala went to the jets and they got a new guy. And that defense was every bit as good, if not better this year than it was last year. So, but you do have to get another good D coordinator, but I think Shanahan makes really good decisions when it comes to his assistants. Uh, the key for San Francisco is, like you guys said, it's figuring out the quarterback. Is it Purdy or is it Lance? I think it's one of those two guys. you got to rock with one of those. I liked what I saw out of Purdy, but you really haven't got to see Trey Lance, and you spent a high draft pick on Trey Lance. So you're going. To, that's where Mr. Greco is right. Shanahan is going to have to make a decision when it comes to one of those two guys. Um, but I think you can chalk both of those situations up to injury. Um, and you didn't, you didn't get to see how far Purdy could take you because he got knocked out early in the championship game. And then obviously Trey Lance got knocked out in the very beginning of the game. And I know he had a really bad game in Chicago, but that game was in like a monsoon and you're a rookie. That's not what you want to see. And you can't really get an accurate judge. Not ideal circumstances. No, you can't get an accurate judge of your first round draft pick in a monsoon in Chicago. I mean, anyone who's lived near those great lakes know how crazy that weather is when it rains or snows. And Trey Lance, like a third year man. Um, this will be his third year, I think. I yeah, think he got drafted I mean, and he sat behind Jimmy G, and they were trying to have him learn. And then they tried to start him this year, and then he got knocked out. So this will be his third year, I think. Um, but he hasn't got a full year to start. We so we have not we have nobody at work to see him. So he's an insanely talented kid. We didn't get to see a lot out of him out of college, but I'm interested to see. Okay, now on the negative side for Cincinnati, I already mentioned that they have to pay people. Here's the other reason why I think that it's it's San Francisco and not Cincinnati. Look at the competition. Who is your competition in the NFC if you're the 49ers? The Eagles? And that's it. The, 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 well, who's, the other, who's the other name that you're going to say is your major competition in the NFC? I go to the AFC, and who's your competition is the Bengals. The Ravens, if they can figure out with Lamar what's going on, your own division. Um, the Bills, the Chiefs. The Jacksonville Jaguars, who are up and coming, and and Trevor Lawrence is going to be a problem once Trevor Lawrence figures it out. Doug Peterson is going to fix Trevor Lawrence and that disaster with Urban Meyer last year that happened. So Trevor Lawrence is going to come up and coming. You still have to account for Justin Herbert. I know that the Chargers are going to charge her, but you still have to account for Justin Herbert. Those are those are only five that I've named. And I haven't even named some other people that could cause them. The Browns, if them, Cincinnati and Deshaun Washington. The Bills. Bills. Cincinnati just blew out the Bills. I don't think they're – I think Cincinnati. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but see, you that's one game, though, Wellington. Like, you saw that Cincinnati beat the Chiefs three times in a row. And what finally happened? It's it's one thing when you build up all that credential. Play. A 50-50 a foul at the end. I mean, they were right. Oh, there. <laughs> Wellington, that wasn't 50-50. He was three yards out of bounds, and he pushed him. He held up his hands on his arms after he pushed him. He knew he messed up. I'm just playing the devil's advocate. I agree with you. I'm yeah, I know you're playing the devil's advocate. Okay. Again, 
Okay, you can say that they beat all these teams, but the point is your competition, you got to keep beating them is my point. Right. Yeah. You got to keep going through those guys. I didn't even mention Pittsburgh if they get together with Tomlin and Kenny Pickett can put it together. Um, there is just, His own division is loaded with competitors. And you right. just I, I know that there's indecision with Lamar and there's a lot of controversy in Baltimore right now. I just cannot believe with as good as that our organization has been in terms of consistently being there almost every year that they're not going to make some noise again. I think that Kenny Pickett could be really good with Mike Tomlin. They seemed like he was their quarterback of the future. And I just, I need to see one more year to, before I, I throw in the towel with Deshaun Watson, he doesn't look like he's good, but the Browns are the one team that have kind of had the Bengals number. So his own division is going to be hard to get out of. Um, the Colts, I know if they can get a quarterback, could make some noise. I know that this is starting to grasp the straws. But I'm just trying to say, all these teams that are perennially contenders are in the AFC. The, the 49ers are not going to have to go through the gauntlet that the Bengals will in the AFC. And then, like I said, then you put on top, you have to pay these guys. And so who are you going yeah. to be able to contain? Joe Burrow has been very fortunate that he has had this receiving core. I, I, I want to give him all his credit, but he has been very fortunate to have the best, re- what I p- believe is the best receiving core in the NFL. They're going to keep Jamar Chase, but what happens with Tyler Boyd and T Higgins when you have to pay Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase? I just don't think you can keep both of them if either if either of them when you have to pay that. Yeah. Then you on, add on top of it, they have to get him an offensive line. So yeah. you either free agency or you're going to have to hit on some draft picks. So, and, and after all that, I just don't think that their defense is that good. So you, you're going to have to get pieces on the defense too. So, okay, the defense plays very well in spots, but that defense can be had. That defense can be had, as you saw with the Chiefs. So, again, I know that's Mahomes and the Chiefs, so everybody else you can't say. But but the be, the, the Ravens were in that game before Huntley fumbled on the goal line. I firmly believe the Ravens would have knocked out the Bengals had Huntley not fumbled on the bang, on that goal line because the Ravens' defense had the Bengals' number that whole game. And if you had not had that huge momentum swing of a 99-yard touchdown return for the defense, right. and they only won by that one score. They only won by that one touchdown. So, again, all due credit to the Bengals, but there is a gauntlet in the AFC, and I put my Chiefs right there. Like, I am concerned every year for my Chiefs because I know how hard it is to win in the AFC right now. But you go over to the yeah. NFC, you just have to beat the Eagles. Like, I know they're the Cowboys are there. Yeah, I know the Cowboys are yeah, there. This <laughs> okay, for this year. Yeah, that's valid to say. But look, look at the NFC landscape. All There's so many teams in the NFC that are rebuilding. So right now, the, the 49ers, if they can just – this is my caveat. If the 49ers can pick a quarterback and stick with him and he can be consistent – and do not uh, do enough to not lose them games. That team is dummy proof when they are healthy. Mr. Greco's right; they got to stay healthy. But that team, when they are healthy, is dummy proof for a quarterback because they are loaded at every position. And before anyone says, "Well, aren't they going to have to pay?" All their guys, they're paying already. They're, from my knowledge, all their main guys, they're paying and they have locked up right now. So they're not going to have the worry of paying their quarterback. And that's the other beautiful thing: Trey Lance and Brock Purdy. If you go with either one. You're not paying them. You're not paying the the most expensive position to pay in in the uh, on the team. Whereas Cincinnati, you're going to have to pay Joe Burrow this this off season. San Francisco has been you know on the verge, on the cusp for at least the last four. Or five. And you go back to Alex Smith and and Kaepernick since the you know 2012, 13, and 14. San Francisco's always been kind of right there on the cuffs and just can't just can't uh, get over the hump. And they, well, they yeah, but. I keep seeing this. <laughs> but like the, no, but scenario. like the Chiefs, this the 49ers are consistently there. So why are we doubting that they're gonna keep being there or maybe higher? Whereas the Bengals, they've only had two years of this. You've only seen it for two years. So why do you suddenly believe in the Bengals after only two years? But the 49ers, the whole 2010s and 2020s, the 49ers are consistently in contention and getting to the championship game a couple mm-hmm. times of the Super Bowl. The Bengals have just done it twice. And again, I know Joe Burrow is he is the cat's meow. He is Joe Cool, Joe Shiesty. But he's only done it two years. It's only two years. And they made it to the Super Bowl once, and they got knocked out by the Chiefs the other time. Right. So yeah. the, the Bengals have got to prove to me that they can sustain this. The 49ers to me have already proved with Shanahan they can constantly be in contention regardless of who's at quarterback. J- Jimmy G, they have been in the championship, I think, two or three years, and in the Super Bowl one of the years with just Jimmy G. 
And I think we all agree that Jimmy G is average to below average at quarterback. Yeah. So if you can solve the quarterback issue, I think the sky's the limit for the 49ers. That's that's just where I land on it. That was his guy, though. Jimmy G was his that guy. Was, that, that was who him and, and Lynch brought in. Um, but I, I think you saw his limitations, and Shanahan got the most out of that that orange that he could squeeze. So I think Trey Lance and and Brock Purdy have a lot more tools in their bag than Jimmy G do. So it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Take a look. Definitely. Who who do you who do you guys think that they go to out of those? If I could just kick it to you guys, who do you guys think that they go to out of those two? I would I would probably lean toward Lance right now. I think Trey Lance. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, as good as, as good as Brock, the, uh, the young kid showed. You, you definitely still saw his limitations. The kid, uh, he's a good kid. He's got a good head on his shoulder. And what he struggled happened. in that first half versus Seattle too. I mean, that wasn't that wasn't a dead giveaway until the second half. Well, but let's be fair to him. That was his first – he's a rookie, and that was his first playoff game. He's allowed to struggle in the first playoff game. What did he do the second half, Wellington? What did he do – he, he he torched that defense in the second half. He popped off. I think he had um, – he, he was the best per quarterback performer that first week. If you looked at QB statisticals, he was the best QB performer he, that week. He did, he did. He got the ball to his playmakers. Chan, I give Shanahan credit there. You got the kid in a position to get the ball to his playmakers. Well, that's what I'm saying. That that team's dummy proof. If you can get it to the playmakers and they're there healthy, that's all you got to do. Is it's 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 the same thing. Mahomes is flashy, but when you look at it with Mahomes, Mahomes just gets it to his guys and lets them make magic happen. That's what he's done this year, and that's why he's become so successful. He's not forcing the ball to Tyreek deep. Um, and I know Mr. Greco touched on it earlier. I still see the the loss of Tyreek as a net positive because it forced Mahomes to evolve his game into the short game and start hitting the guys and making reads rather than, okay, pump, first read's not there. Okay, then where's Tyreek? No, you can't do that no more. His game became more mature this season. It's more mature, and that is going to make him more successful. And so it's the same thing with the 49ers. It's, It's Mahomes this year, check it down, let my playmakers, let my guys, let Travis Kelsey, MVS, Juju, Pacheco, McKinnon, all those guys, let them go make the plays. I'm not going to play hero ball anymore and get myself into trouble and just chuck it up to my deep threat and get in trouble like I did last year. And it's the same thing with Purdy, what Shanahan is having to do with Purdy. Get it to Debo. Get it to CMC. Get it to Brandon Ayuk. Get it to George Kittle. Let them make the plays because they're dynamic. Now, at some point, you're going to have to throw it down the field. That's where I will. I, I, you're probably going there. You're going to have to throw it down the field. But As here's we the saw other thing. Jimmy G and, and Emmanuel Sanders, that was the difference between that Super Bowl. It was. Now, if you watch the games, Brock Purdy don't let, does not look like he has that limitation in terms of arm strength. Jimmy G was a physical limitation of arm strength. Like he just could not physically get the ball down the field. Brock Purdy does not look like he has that limitation. It's just going to be, can he accurately hit the people? And I think that will come with more reps in time. My, I, I get what you guys are saying with Trey Lance. My one concern with Trey Lance, I know he's a first round draft pick. They traded up to get him. At this point, you've seen more of Purdy than you have Trey Lance. So Trey Lance is the riskier pick, as odd as that sounds, to go with Trey Lance. Because you've only seen Trey Lance for one game and one season of not starting. Whereas Brock Purdy came in halfway through the season, and you saw what he can give you. So that's going to be the tough decision to see out of Shanahan. It's it's a tough pickle to be in because Purdy looked really good in the games he started, and you have not seen Trey Lance. But how do you justify not playing Trey Lance when he's the second overall pick in the draft? Well, I just think their consistency of their San Francisco's offensive performers. They've got all these stars, but these guys aren't consistent enough for me. They look good. Kittle, he's great. He'll give you two or three great outstanding games during the year, and you say, boy, that Kittle's so great. But then, you know, where's he at the rest of the year? Uh, Sambo, uh, Samuels, Debo. I mean, same thing. A lot of those guys, that you say, what's the name? The running back, is he still with them? Most start? Uh, uh, he's in he's in um, Miami now. But they get these kind of guys, that, you know, the Tevin Coleman's, these guys that give you two or three games, but they're not right. consistently good over the whole season. And that's for some reason, that's the problem with San Francisco. They just can't keep a complete team on the field. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were 13 and they were 13 and four in the regular season. So I, I don't know if they need to keep those guys on the field to win games. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but they're still finding a way to win games. It comes to the money games. Well, it do, it does, but they're paid right now. So I mean, at least for now. Yeah, when it comes, it'll to be interesting to see. Games, those playoff games is where it counts, and you, that that's where they fall short consistently. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I'll get to our first NBA topic with Kyrie's major trade to Dallas and also, you know, what's next for Brooklyn because, you know, th- in the past week they, they, they lose Katie and Kyrie. Um, this trade became official um, this past Sunday with the Mavericks and Dorian Finney-Smith, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, and some unprotected first-round picks. Um, Kyrie also made his debut, uh, debut versus the Clippers, scoring um, 24 and winning by six. But, but, but to you, Mr. Greco, like, the conversation around Kyrie has always been that whatever team he's at, he's eventually going to blow it up. It's going to be good at the beginning. Then there's going to be some disagreement or frustration about what he actually wants. But what are your thoughts on him going to Dallas? I think that the backcourt between him and Luka can be phenomenal, but I also don't see him staying there long term because I don't know what he's actually going to want at the end. You know what I mean? So, so, so how, how do you feel about the, the trade and what it does for, for the Mavericks? I tell you, man, this this Kyrie Irving, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I love him because I love to watch him. Right. Okay, I mean, this guy has, and I'm old school, and uh, I go way back. <laughs> okay, but this kid has got some handles, and as a referee, you know, everybody, well, all of them is carrying the ball. No, this kid's not carrying the ball. This boy's got some fantastic handles. He's an outstanding talent, but his history just shows, man. You just can't depend on him over no length of time. I mean, even in college, he do. He was, and it, yeah, he got hurt. Eleven games, but for some reason, he doesn't finish the deal. He played eleven games at Duke. Okay, I understand that he had problems in high school. <laughs> okay, uh, he goes to the Cavaliers. Okay, he was hurt starting out. He showed the talent. LeBron got there. They got the championship. Okay, personal opinion: if he'd have been available in fifteen, I don't know that uh, 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 Golden State would have won that first one. Okay, LeBron took him to six by himself because him, Love and uh, Kyrie were uh, both uh, were both hurt in in the uh, finals. He's great. I think he's going to mix well. Uh, ballers can ball. I don't care who they play with. So Doncic and Kyrie are going to be fun to watch. Oh yeah. But can they win anything? I, I just don't see it. I mean, uh, uh, there's going to be less defense played. Okay, because Kyrie is not known for his defense unless he's playing Harden. Just because that's just somebody he wants to retaliate against because he, he has a chip against him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But uh, him and Doncic will play well together. I don't have any problem with that. I think they're going to play well together. But they still, it's still just the two of them. Okay. Mm-hmm. You still don't have the, the third best players was done with him and you traded him. Okay. They still don't have anybody else that can do anything for themselves on the court. They still have to sit there and wait for somebody to give them the ball. Um, I, I don't see them making a big move. They're going to be exciting. They're going to score a lot of points. Uh, they're almost a resemblance of what Brooklyn was with Kyrie and uh, with Durant in that until they got these other mixes and started adding to defense, Claxton involved into a defensive player. Yeah. I know people uh, yeah. hate on Ben Simmons, but he plays a lot of good defense for them. Uh, until they were getting the other players to find their role and, 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 and be included, uh, all they were was Kyrie and Durant shooting the ball. Okay, but until they got that defense built up and some players doing that, Dallas is going to have to do something with that, man. They they, yeah. they don't have yeah. – I don't know what they're going to do with this Christian Wood. I haven't yet to see what's the game plan for Christian Wood. He's never involved in anything in since half a season already. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not even scoring and doing as much as he did with Houston. Uh, you can't sit around and just look at it at, at, and marvel at, at Luka and how great he is. Um, I think Dallas is going to be a solid team. I think they're going to make the playoffs and what have you. But I, I still think they're going to have the, the same issues. Uh, and then, like I said, we don't know what Kyrie's going to do. He's going to be happy for the next for the next month or what have you. And then he's going to have another issue. Did the WNBA get their planes for the women? So he's going to be mad about that. He might sit out a you know a month because uh, he's protesting they don't have commercial that they're still flying commercial. He's always got an issue, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that has nothing to do with basketball. And uh, and it's I, I hate it for the young man. I understand you've got a platform and you're trying to exercise that platform, but they pay you to play basketball. They pay you to be a winner. To go out here that's and help the number one thing. Out. We want to see you play because that's what you're getting and paid for. That's what the whole thing is, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you, you, you just not accomplished that, you know? And we don't have to re- go back over the steps, you know, Cleveland and then Boston and then and Jersey, uh, Brooklyn. And now, yeah. you, and now you're going to go down there with Dallas. Cuban is desperate. He knows he needs to get something down there with Luka. He's going to mess around and lose him. But that kid is phenomenal. This was but, to appease Luca. I definitely think this was a move to appease Luca because Luca, yeah, he's yeah. he does he doesn't want to just be that guy who's just running the show and then flaming out you in the first or second you round. Can't survive that way. Yeah, you know he, he's not gonna be able to survive that way. But 
but he still they still lack other pieces. Right. Okay, the Max Cleavers and the Dwight Powells and the Tim Hardaways and Bullock. I mean, they're they're one dimensional guys, and uh, they they don't really add a lot. You know, they, people tell me they play a little defense. I I just don't see it. Uh, Jason yeah. Kidd's got his work yeah. cut out for him, uh, but you just can't score your way. And you know their duo is great, but their duo is it any better than some of these other duos is out there as far as scoring is concerned? I don't see it. No, and, and to, to, to you, Mikhail, what are your initial thoughts on this trade and and, and kind of what this does for? It? Obviously, this this is an upgrade because because you're, you're getting an elite guard, but it also is concerns about what you what you lost defensively um, in a loaded Western Conference. Yeah, was it an upgrade? I don't I don't know. I, uh, it's one of those things where again, Kyrie's. Kyrie's phenomenal, but you you get in the whole package with Kyrie. So I mean, I'm being a little on on the nose there. I, I think it is an overall upgrade. Yeah. But uh, Mr. Greco really already hit a lot of the points I was going to make too. But I'll just I'll just try and add my two cents worth and some other points as well. Um, the defense is going to take a dip. Luca doesn't play any defense, and neither does Kyrie. So that is going to be a bad defensive backcourt. Now Luca did pick it up in the play- playoffs last year that they were a bad defensive team in the regular season and they became a lot more solid in the playoffs. So they, they can make adjustments in the playoffs, but I still just don't know if they have enough. A lot like Mr. Mr. Greco said, it's just, that's going to be a lot of scoring. I'm also not sure. Are they really going to work well together? Because they're both really heavy ISO players. And that just, that does not usually bode well for a team when you got two guys just sitting over there playing ISO and the rest of everybody's standing around when the new thing, you know, is what Golden State does and, you know, motion and a lot of moving parts. I mean, ISO can work well in spots, but if you get a good defensive team that just clamps down on you, two guys playing ISO, well, then you better hope that they both hot as hot as a cat on a hot tin roof or else they're not going to be able to get going because it's just going to be – the other guy's going to be cold while the other guy's just ISO and getting a shot. So we'll see. I think that they are good enough to where they can find a way to work. Overall, I think this is a win in the short term. They did do this to please Luka, but is it going to really please Luka in the long run? Because if Kyrie pulls what Kyrie usually pulls, I worry about that alienating Luka for the Mavs and that possibly – jeopardizing the Mavs keeping a hold of Luka because I could foresee Luka if they try and lock up Kyrie unless this is really just a rental and if it's a rental you made a really bad deal then I think because this, you this has sent, to be a rental I, I don't I don't see any way Kyrie stays here even I, this I agree but but then Wellington if it's a rental that's such a bad rental why would you why would you ship off I again I know shit Spencer Dinwiddie's no world beater but why would you send off two player players and picks just for a, a, a rental that's not even going to get you to the finals. Like, they're not getting to the finals with this team. I, I don't think any one of us would 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 disagree with that. Like, I, I the gauntlet in the West is too – there's teams that are too well put together. I mean, I know that the Denver, um, they've had their issues, but Denver looks really good this year because they're all healthy. They've got a good bench, and if Murray can stay healthy, that's a complete team. I would have picked the Denver. Suns, I would have picked Denver before another team we're about to talk about made their move. Well, yeah, and I think the other team is the Suns that we're about to say because that was the next team that I was yeah. going to mention. They went and made this move for for KD. Yeah. Um, the Lakers made some really good moves. I still don't know that's enough to get them over the the hump. But okay, what is it with people and just trading with the Lakers and not getting anything in return? The Lakers are like give us your players and we'll give you um. Just keep this, the hoodwink, hoodwinking this, people. It's like a hoodwink game. It's like yeah. they they get so many players back for a bunch of nothing. And I just the 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 three way team trade. And I know this is a little bit off off topic, but the three way team trade with Utah, Minnesota, and the Lakers. How the Lakers got D'Angelo Russell and two players for the for the Jazz, and all the Jazz got back was Russell Westbrook. What <laughs> what is going? How did the anyways? You said it, Wellington. It's just they hoodwink people. But <laughs> not to say the Lakers are there. Um, the Warriors. I until the Warriors are not there, I refuse to believe. That the Warriors are not going to make some okay, and and I know that sounds crazy to say, but everyone shipped them in and left them for dead last playoffs. Last playoffs, everyone did the same exact thing. So until they are out of the playoffs, until they are limited, or someone knocks them out in the playoffs, I refuse to believe that Golden State is not a problem in the West. I know that there are Western Conference teams that are like, we're not scared of them anymore. Okay. You said that last year, and it bit you on the rear end, and Boston yeah. said the same thing. We're better than them, and what did Golden State do yet again, okay? So 
They got Kyrie. Is all that to say? Basically, they got Kyrie, but it's not getting them over the hump. If this is a rental, I just, I think it's a good move in terms of it's gonna. I think it ensures that they make it out of the se- out of the first round and they make it into the second round. Maybe depending on matchup, they make it to the championship if they can get in a knockdown drag out. And if I don't believe that, but maybe they could. But they're not beating whoever's in the in the Western Conference championship game. I just. This seems like a lateral move, a one-year rental that's just going to end up blowing up like a firecracker in their face because Kyrie's going to do what Kyrie does, and then I just really worry what that's going to do to Luka. So it, it's a fun trade, and it's an exciting trade. Mr. Greco oh, made some great points. Kyrie is fun to watch. Gonna He's going to be fun to watch with Luka. Yeah. It's going to be on an offensive fireworks show, but it's going to be an offensive fireworks show that just like on the 4th of July, it fizzles out and dies, and then there's nothing left but ashes. Yeah, it was it was about marketing and public relations. Mark Cuban knows he has to do something. And to me, it was all about marketing and public relations. He had to do some kind of move to, to appease his fan base. They already were going through those inner office problems with the sexual, uh, whatever allegations was going on. Mm-hmm. I think it was really a marketing move. He has to do something. He just couldn't sit on it. I just and think you should have brought in more pieces more right. role player pieces rather than one big flashy piece because I know you don't want to put it all on Luca, but you you got to bring in some more extra pieces rather than just one big piece that's going to – now, what's the other thing that we didn't mention that will help Luca is Kyrie's a ball handler, and so that's going to helpfully take down Luca in terms of usage rates. Yeah. But the other thing I saw, you Luca this year is second in usage rate, and Kyrie is eight. So you've got two dudes who are top ten in usage rate. I mean – Hopefully, if they're on the same team, then then that can collectively lower their numbers, actually, because you're going to be taking turns rather than it's all going through you night in and night out. But at the same time, it just goes back to that ISO and that usage rate. Like I said, these two dudes are dudes who get used way too much on offense. Kyrie is not a point guard, okay? It's been proven that. I mean, he's a point guard in name only, okay? But, uh, you know, I mean, over a 40-minute, 48-minute game, yeah, they'll both get theirs and what have you. That's what's important. But as far as winning basketball, no, I, it's, it's not going to happen. I, I don't see it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and getting to, to, to the next big trade, obviously, with Phoenix getting um, KD and, and what this kind of does to the West race. Um, in this blockbuster trade, it included um, Mikel Bridges, Cam Johnson, Jay Crowder, and, and four unprotected future first-round picks. And they also get TJ Warren, who has been a quality uh, 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 defender throughout, throughout the season. And... When you have a, because obviously Chris Paul, like the the the, the storyline, him never winning a ring. A couple of years ago, he was in the finals against Milwaukee. He's he's kind of had that that kind of promo of being one of the elite guards we've ever seen, but just always kind of being ringless. And then you add in KD and then Booker with what they do. I feel like that this is um a a, a clear favorite in the West. Not saying that they'll, they'll win the whole thing, but I definitely think this is the best team in the West now. To you, Mr. Greco, like what are your thoughts on this move for Phoenix? And obviously, KD's going to get criticism as being the bandwagon guy from this. Like, like, like that is going to be a, a, a circulating theme. But, but what are what are some of your initial thoughts on this? Well, okay. First of all, I'm a Kevin Durant fan. Yeah, me too. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm an NBA fan. Kevin Durant's my favorite player. Okay, um, has he done some things? Yeah, not so great. But on the court, I love to watch him. Okay, definitely an upgrade for him. Um, I'm not going to jump on this bus and say they're going to win the championship. Because uh, you, they lost, Phoenix lost a lot, and it it starting five, which is going to count in the playoffs, they're going to be tough. But you've only got three months put 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 this team together and, and get fluid with each other, mm. and that's going to be mm-hmm. tough to do. The good thing about it is Kevin Durant can play in any kind of style. Booker can play in any kind of style. Okay, you got Chris Paul, who's the floor general. Okay, but there's no depth. Okay, that, that there's no depth whatsoever. Uh, Aiton is yet to play up to where he needs to be. Okay, right. I right. understand this is the new NBA, and people don't want to hear this. But Aiton is seven foot, seven one, or six eleven, whatever he is. There's no reason for him to be out here trying to shoot three pointers and all that kind of stuff. First of all, he can't do it. <laughs> at least, Joel, at least Joel Embiid that's can do key. it. <laughs> that's the key. That's the key. Yeah, that's the key. That's to do it. What's the point of being out there and saying he can shoot like he's hitting twelve percent? Okay, get you a tall long butt inside and, and get some lobs and grab some rebounds and help out down down yeah. there. You're gonna have to get a, de- a defense. You know, you're gonna have to get a defensive identity. Okay, 
They're going to have to. Yeah, they're going to be able to score. They're going to be able to match you offensively, anybody in the in the league, okay, with Chris Paul running that show, okay? Uh, the pickup of Warren, if he can stay healthy, is going to help them, mm. okay? They pick up a kid from Oklahoma City, a little young kid uh, named Baisley. He's about 6'8 forward uh, that they got from Oklahoma City. And uh, the kid, was, he's not playing as much this year because they had some really good rookies, but he's not a bad little player, bad young player. He's right. going to help their depth. I still think they're going to need some more help on that front line. They've got Aiton and Biombo or whatever uh, uh, at, at their center position. Uh, they're going to need some more guard help, some backup guard here. I'm, I've never been convinced of Cameron Payne. Uh, the Damian Lee kid is pretty good. He can, you know, he's got that little ego. He thinks he's, he's good, better than what he is because he used to play with Steph. So he thinks, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think they're going to need some uh, uh, backcourt depth. But as far as it's on paper, it looks really good. I think that uh, I like Monty Williams as a coach. I think Great they'll coach. be able to figure it out. I think they'll be a definitely. Obviously, they're going to be a factor in the in the playoffs and what have you. Because the thing about the West, I don't think you have other than. In, and I, I heard you say this early, and I would definitely agree. Right now, I would th- still see Denver coming out of the West. You know, because there's nobody in the West can do anything with Jokic. Okay? Nobody. Nobody in the West as a player that can can do anything with Jokic. I I don't see it. OK, and that's why they were able to give away that Bones Highland at the point guard that they yeah. had. Yeah. They run their offense so much through Jokic, because now I think that really hurt them in the long run, because all they got is they're depending on Murray. And I'm not so sure Murray is going to be able to hold up in the long run. But I still think Denver's got the best depth. Player. Denver's got depth, though. Yeah. And they picked up that kid, Rob, uh, the kid from uh, Lakers, the center, Robinson. Mm-hmm. I can't believe they let him get a, they let him go. Uh, at, yeah. was, was it Robinson? What's his name? Seven Brian. 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 Thomas Brian. Thomas Brian. Brian. Yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. That's his name, Brian. Uh, that's going to help them quite that a was bit. A steal. Uh, uh, so in a matchup there, they still don't have anything that can go in there with Jokic and, and slow him down. As far as anybody else in the West, you know, they're competitive with them, and uh, they don't have a, uh, like I said, they're they don't have a defensive identity. They're going to have to find a way to have a defensive identity. And Aiton is not naturally a defensive player. Chris Paul has gotten too old to be a great defensive player. Um, mm. You know, uh, so that's where their limitations are going to be. Everybody's jumping on them thinking, oh, Kevin's going to just step in there. Yeah, he's going to come in and be Kevin Durant. He's going to do his thing, and he's going to mesh well. And before Booker was hurt, I'm sorry, I think he's the best two guard in the league. But uh, so offensively, I don't see really see a problem. But I just don't see where are they going to play deep. None of the Booker and Paul have never been known for their defense. You gotta have to win the champs. You gotta have some kind of di- defensive identity. You gotta yeah. be able to stop Yogi. Yeah. You're gonna have to stop Giannis. You're gonna have to stop these other guys. And I don't see it. To to, to Mikhail, looking at this trade, what are your initial thoughts on it? Like, how how do you are you are you kind of kind of going on record that this should be the favorite in the West? Like, where do you think this team stands in terms of the predictions and just the, kind of the hype that that, that they're um, bringing? I, I think they should be the favorite personally. I, I, I hear what all we're saying with Denver. Um, the, the interesting thing with Denver is Denver has some injury history with a lot of those players. So you got to cross your fingers and hope that everyone does stay healthy for Denver, which they have proven they can do this year. Um, they are deeper, but the starting five, man, I mean, it's Chris Paul, it's not Devin Booker, uh, Kevin Durant, TJ Warren is probably going in the four spot. Kevin Durant or Kevin Durant may play the four because he's technically listed as taller than TJ Warren. So they play TJ Warren at the three and Kevin Durant at the four. And then DeAndre Ayton. And I get that DeAndre Ayton has had his struggles, but let me tell you, this is coming from a Nuggets fan. I, I have a couple of Nuggets fans in my life that told me, and maybe they're watching different basketball than you, Mr. Greco, but they said that they actually are scared of Ayton because Ayton plays the best defense on Jokic that they've watched in the league. So, I mean, that's coming straight from a nugget, a couple of Nuggets fans' mouths, is that there's they don't like Aiton because Aiton plays because he's mobile and he's long, and that's what gives Jokic problems, and he has good hands on defense. So maybe it's just other teams he looks bad against, but I, and I'm not going to say you're not going to lock Jokic down because Jokic is going to get his. Yeah, but um, I think they should be the favorites just because the NBA is a different beast than other sports in terms of – Depth. When you get into playoff basketball, depth is important. 
your your starters are going to play way more increased minutes though than what they would play in the regular season because they're trying to keep them healthy for the playoffs. And so you're you're going to see those usage numbers, those minutes go way up for your starters. So the the NBA that we see today in today's game in the playoffs, I just don't think that your bench is is nearly as important as that's just my that's my opinion. I think your starters play so many minutes now. You know, the guard you know play the is the Golden mantra. You remember the Golden State mantra? Strength in numbers. Strength in numbers. <laughs> I know. You, you know who was always out on the floor though for the large majority of that game though? Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. The, the big names were the ones that were out on the floor the majority of the time though. So they can say strength in numbers, but Dray, the last time I checked, Draymond, Steph, and Clay in the big moments were all there for thirty-two plus minutes. So just keep so that in mind. Good. They. Gary Payton and Otto Porter and yeah. what? <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We will year. see. That starting five is going to be brutal because Chris Paul pressure. can now literally all the pressure's off Chris Paul now with KD in there. Any pressure. He doesn't. He doesn't need to be a scorer anymore. He literally can just do what he's best at and facilitate. Here, Booker. Here, Kevin Durant. Here, De- uh, DeAndre Ayton on the pick and roll, or here, TJ Warren in the corner. Or, you know, campaign, give me a break for a little bit so I can just chill and let my old self get a few rests on the bench. He literally can do what he is best at, and that is be the pure point god that, you know, he gets as a nickname, is point god. That's all he's got to do now. Booker is going to go insane in the playoffs. Like Mr. Greco said, best two guard in the league. I I 100% agree with that. I'm not a fan of Booker, personally. I think he's a little cocky. I know they're all cocky a little bit. But he's got this attitude. When him and Chris Paul were mean mugging Giannis, and just making and clowning Giannis, I, I was so happy to see Giannis beat them because I was like, bro, you don't poke the bear until it's the same thing with Cincinnati. I hate to go back to that, but it's like, don't poke the bear until you've shot the bear and he's hanging on your wall. Don't poke right. the bear, okay? And they did that, to, and they did that to Luca too when Luca was down last year, and Luca got him. So Booker just has this thing where he likes to clown people before the job's done. So, but he still his talent is undeniable. KD is still KD. When he's healthy, he's a top five player in the NBA. And then Aiden's still a good piece. I know he needs to develop. He needs to fix his attitude. The, the dude is still 7-1 with an insane wingspan and one of the best pick and roll guys in the game. So that they are a complete starting five. The bench is going to be an interesting thing. Can't can the starters do enough to get them all the way there? I think I think the bench is important because we also did see it last year with with, with the Celtics. They had a better bench than they, they, you guys saw two teams with really good benches. So that is true. Benches do sometimes, they are important. But I think you've seen with Milwaukee, the year that they won, they didn't have a great bench and they won and they beat the Suns. And I think the Suns had a better bench that year. Um, so you don't always need a better bench. You just have to have guys that can come in and spot relieve. Now, the defensive issues, they're going to have to figure it out on defense when those starting five guys are out there. But I think they can do enough. Um, Chris Paul is going to be a weak link. Devin Booker actually, I don't think is too bad at defense. He's not an amazing defender like Lockdown, but he can he can do the job. He's serviceable, and KD is usually still a pretty good defender when he is healthy. And then TJ Warren's actually probably the best defender out of those starting five, um, out of those five guys. So I think it's I think it's right now it's Denver and the Suns, and I don't hate I don't hate the pick if you think that the the Denver uh, the Nuggets are still the favorite. I don't hate that pick because of the depth. Um, my only thing with Denver is. I gotta, I gotta make sure that they stay healthy in the playoffs. That's my concern with Denver because you know Murray's gone out in the playoffs. MPJ has his injury history, and if those two guys, you know, are not are not healthy, then it's basically just boils down to the Jokic show, and that's not what you really want to see. But those Isn't are the two, those are the two teams. Isn't it amazing that Durant that we just automatically assume that he comes back and it's going to be at twenty nine ten and. You know, he's going to be this amazing oh, yeah. player. He, he's Everybody a pure scorer. He looks the same after the worst. He's a pure scorer. Yeah. He's coming off a sprained MCL, missing a month. And the last year was the eighth. And it's just amazing. I hate that everybody expects him just to step in there and never miss a beat. And everybody else has to take – look at how long it's taking Kawhi and Jamal yeah. Murray and these it's other just guys. the same again. He just steps back on the court. And he's, just a, he's just a baller. But yeah. uh, we'll see. I think I, I, the thing about depth, you don't need 10 deep. But you got to be able to replace when you bring somebody out. Somebody can come in and, and, and give you some numbers. If Grant sitting, you need somebody to come in there to replace him in, with, with with something. You know, if if you're not actually you're not going to score like him, but you got at least give me some defense, some rebounds, give me something. Mm-hmm. And that's what you. And that's why the the beauty of what Golden State did last year. You know, when one of the stars were out, they had somebody came in and gave you 
something special. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. that's where I see them lacking on, on, on the bench. I just don't see Durant sitting the bench very long like he did with the, the when he was on the Nets and they played Milwaukee. He played almost all 40 minutes of the game. Um, I think he's going to see this as one of his last shots too. him and Chris Paul is kind of like their swan song in terms of he can play more years. But like this is one of those situations where this is the best situation you're probably going to have the remainder of your career to win a championship. So this is one of those where we we talked about in football. Mr. Greco talked about all those guys that are banged up. Everyone's banged up come that time of the year. You're going to leave it all on the line on the field. The same thing with the playoffs. It's you, you, you got to make a run at the finals. You don't know when you're going to have another good shot. You're going to play a lot of minutes in playoff basketball. You just, everyone's playoff minutes go way up when you get to the playoffs. So I just don't see KD sitting the bench for very long. Now you're right. Someone's going to have to come in to relieve him for a little bit of time, but it's one of those where I think Monty's smart enough to where he says, okay, KD, you, you got enough of a rest and KD is going to, for sure say, yeah, I'm good, and he's going to put him right back out there if it starts going south. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I, you know, like I said, they're going to uh, – their formal yeah. – I really think this is good for them for next year, to be truthful with you. Mm. Uh, I think next year is when they're going to really be good. It's Phoenix. Yeah, a it's full season. A full season, yeah. not having not yeah. having to, to do it half, like at the latter, little, latter end. Yeah, they get a little – acquire a little extra depth and what have you. Yeah. And I think Chris Paul has at least one more in him. And if you get a quality backup, so Chris doesn't have to play as much during the season. Uh, so I really look for them for next year. I, I, I can see them getting to the finals, but in that West, it's just all depend. You know, there's, you know, we, I don't know if we're going to talk about them, but there's three or four other teams that could be right there uh, in that in that finals real easy. Can we talk about another aspect of this real quick too, and how big of a failure this Nets era was with with that team? Like, it's. <sighs> It was predictable, but at the same time, for some reason, it's still disappointing. It's just like, again, maybe it just boils down to Kyrie just pulling a Kyrie on KD. But like out of all the teams KD could have gone to when he was with the Nets, he got suckered into going with Kyrie. And then it was just such an abject failure. And then on the Nets side, how do you not get a better piece back for Kevin Durant than Mikhail Bridges? How is that the best thing that you get back for Kevin Durant? I just, I think the Nets are a, a disaster of a franchise. I, I don't want to be overly harsh, but if that's all you get back, and then and the Suns, they're like, oh well, they got first round draft picks. Those Suns first round draft picks aren't going to be anything special. That's going to be late late teen rounds, early twenty rounds, late twenty rounds. And we know in the NBA, those aren't guaranteed players. The NBA is is way more diluted in terms of the NFL. If you get anyone in the first round, they're starter. Guaranteed starter. That's not the NBA, though. Once you go past 12, once you get out of that lottery system, you're just praying and hoping that there is a hit. Now, you've seen some ones that have hit. Giannis, I think, was the 15th overall pick. Um, There's plenty of picks that have been later rounds that have hit. Jokic is a good example. I think Jokic was a second-round guy, and look at what he turned out to be. But that is the... That's the anomaly and not the rule. So I think the Nets just made a terrible trade for them personally. Mikhail Bridges is, an, is a nice piece, but if that's the best thing that you get back for Kevin Durant, I just I, I, they're just such a poorly managed. I don't think what I don't think Sean Marks knows what he's doing. Yeah, the they, they, the the management of the Nets has been in disarray and turmoil forever. Yeah. Okay. yeah there's a reason they've been bad for so long and i think we found out with this era of basketball and uh with this trade i think we found out that's exactly why they've been bad for so long with paul pierce and kevin garnett they didn't do anything with that yep. um, they've been historically since dr J left <laughs> no mm -hmm. <laughs> okay they just can't put it together uh jason kidd tried to get them there for a little while they blew that team up and and and, and, and you know so the nets have historically been a bad organization but as far as the thing with the KD and, uh, you know, everybody's on KD, you know, they talk about his legacy, this, that, and the other. Let him finish his career. And then let's look and see what the chips look like, okay? Yeah, we're talking about he went to Golden State, and this, that, and the other. But when you look at it 10 years down the road and you look at the legacy of, of Kevin Durant, right? you know, right. all they're going to say is what happened. They're going to look and say, he, oh, he won two MVPs. They're going to look and say he's, a, he's on a two-time champ. I still think it looks good for him to try to get another one in. I still think he can get another one in, and this looks like a good opportunity. This, this okay. is the best opportunity he can have to win another one, honestly. Yeah, yeah, okay. But I'm just but just based on his skill sets and what have you, I'm, I'm not going to quite put him in. I'm a big fan. I'm not going to put him in the top 10 of all time, but he's in that 15, 15 to 20. Yeah, I would put him in 15, top 15. Yeah. He's in that 15 to 20 of all-time players. Yeah. And with, with what he's done already, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it didn't, the meshing of those three, you would have took a really strong coach who knew what he was doing, okay, like a Spolster or somebody like that, who could have put those three on the court together, commanded their respect, and let them guys play ball the way they wanted to play, okay? We had COVID, we had injuries, we had all those things that came into that mix. So it was just was not meant to be, okay? But as a threesome, could they play together as they were? They were awesome. Everybody was scared of them. They yeah. would have been awesome. Yeah. It didn't work. Certain things don't work. They brought in Carl Malone and Gary Payton with Shaq and and and, uh, and okay. uh, Kobe. It didn't work. Okay. Uh, these things happen. Garnett and Pierce went over there and to uh, 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 over there to New Jersey and what have you. You know, they, they try to put these super teams, as they call it. It does usually it does not work. Yeah. In, in your favor yeah. like that. And uh, because if they're all available like that, means something was lacking. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it didn't work for New Jersey. I don't give them I, I, I don't fault them for trying. I, I'm New Jersey. I got nothing else going for me. I'm in the city with New York Knicks is always going to be beloved. We got to try it. So I don't I don't fault them for trying. Just like with Q and with Dallas. I don't fault him for hoping that the Kyrie thing works well. It's just not going to work out. Sucks to use up the franchise. OK, because they're not they're Right now, they're stagnant. So you need to, you got a star, but you're not go, you're not seen as being going nowhere. Yeah. So I think uh, a lot of that plays into. I don't fault teams for trying, mm -hmm. and uh, they certainly tried. Did it work? No, it failed miserably. Okay, yeah. but we we move on from there. Yeah, and getting into our last topic with the thoughts on LeBron passing Kareem as the all-time scoring leader and kind of the Lakers' latest moves. Obviously, like LeBron had 38 points this, this past Tuesday night, needing 36 to pass Kareem with him in attendance and many other celebrities. Um, the, the, the Lakers did lose by three to OKC, and afterwards he said, "Quote everything, just stop." It gave me an opportunity to embrace and look around and seeing my, my family, uh, the fans, my friends, end quote. Um, to, to you, Mr. Battles, though, this is this is an amazing accomplishment. And, and the, the MJ debate has just it's just been brought up. It, 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 there, there's no way people can't can can avoid it because they're just automatically going to go to. Does this make LeBron the greatest of all time? Um, and I, everything MJ did um, co looking comparing to what LeBron has done in his career and obviously the, long, the longevity at 38. He's still playing at the highest level. To you, what were your thoughts on this? Because we, we we knew this record was going to get broken by him this season. Um, but what did you think about this and also the the, the, the legacy debate between him and, and, and MJ? Well, first of all, I'm going to give props to LeBron. Okay? That's an incredible record. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. one that most of us never thought we'd see happen. And uh, he had the longevity. He had the skill set. Yeah, I can't knock him for that. I mean, he, he did the thing. OK, but, my, but, you know, but when they start talking about the greatest of all time and all this kind of stuff, what, what tickles me is, OK, they're saying, OK, he's beat Kareem. So that cements him as the best player of all time. OK, well, if getting that scoring record makes him the greatest of all time, how come they weren't saying Kareem was the greatest last week? Because he held the record. OK, right. just because you had to, just because you're the best scorer doesn't mean that you were the best player. OK, and I look at this this argument about, the, you know, uh, being an old school guy, I'm not going to lie. I've seen every finals, NBA finals since 1966. OK, so I've seen every one. Of them. And I look at this thing when you talk about who's the best player. First of all, you, you can't hardly compare over time periods because too many things have changed. Yeah. The biggest thing yeah. being the rules. OK, the rules of the game. If I'm going to look at Kareem and what he did, Mike, what he did, LeBron and what he did. What rule sets were they playing? Because it makes a big difference in the, in, in the, in the NBA, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I like to look at it in two – I break it into two different areas. Uh, who had the best NBA career, which means skill set as well as accomplishments? And then as an ex-player, I look at – if I'm at the playground, and I know a lot of young folks don't play at the playground no more, but if, if I'm on the playground <laughs> and these guys were all out there, who would I pick up? Okay, who would I want on my team? Let's we can maybe go play these other fellas so we can be on the court all day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in in, in 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 that mode, as an NBA career, you know, LeBron's right there in that argument. Oh, yeah. With the championships. Yeah. I think you can make the case LeBron has had the most impressive career because, like, for my generation, I think looking at every player that I've seen personally, LeBron's had the best, most impressive career. Um, yeah, from from from, yeah, from a career yeah. perspective, I think when we get into the totality of achievements. And just legacy impact. You go back to that 2011 finals when he only has eight points in one game. That's where people start saying like, that probably would have never happened with MJ. He never would have got outplayed by a role player. Yeah, 
Well, see, they're, they're, you're nitpicking. Yeah, you know, that, are, and that's how people are going to go. That's how close it gets. We're going to nitpick with a goat conversation, though. You have to nitpick with the goat conversation. It comes down to those nitpicking. To me, one of the greatest accomplishments, LeBron's, when I look at his 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 accomplishments, that going to the finals, you know, from from 211 to 220. Oh, yeah. That to me was, was, was one of the, to me, was the, what, what, what made his legacy for me. The fact that you're in the finals, you didn't win them all. But the fact that you were there to win the championship, you had to go through me, okay, for a ten-year span. Only Bill Russell's done that. So from that standpoint, I got LeBron way up there just because of that, okay. But when you start talking about accomplishments and things of that nature and getting on that court, uh, can LeBron in a game out, you know, out on the playground, be better than Michael Jordan skill-wise? No, I don't think so. Skill-wise. Okay? Otherwise, no. I don't know. About that. <laughs> LeBron has every liter- playmaking, size, okay. athleticism. He's going to make the right basketball play every time. <laughs> well, okay. Then you know what well, I mean? Hold up, hold up, hold up. Then if you're going to go with that, then I'm going to go with the magic argument. Okay, he didn't score as many. Right. But if I'm on a playground right. and want to win a game, magic's not going to lose that game. He's not as good as Mike skill-wise. He's not as dominant as Kareem, okay, and what have you. But he's got the same game as LeBron, and he's going to make a decision. And if you remember, if you go back to the 92 Olympics when they were going out for the Olympic team, Mike's old, it got HIV, and while Mike was the better player, who was the leader of the team? Who led them? Even in practices, who was the ones going? Who, who, Mike went with uh, uh, Magic, said, I got Mike, and yeah. went at it. In those practices and what happened, okay. Personal, my personal belief, I'm a, I'm a, I'm still gonna be a Kareem fan. People think of Kareem, they think of the old man, the ball head, shooting with Worthy and all them. They forget Kareem had ten years prior to that, okay. They forget that in his first four years in the league, he was in the finals. He was in the uh, 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 Western Conference Finals the first four years as a rookie. His first, second, third year, second year he won it, yeah. okay. Coming yeah. in with a 31 and 19. Uh, 31 points and 19 re- or 16 rebounds. Okay, people, they, they don't, young folks, they don't show you films of him as a young boy dominating. Okay, uh, so to me, he's still going to be my all-time. No, well, you know, the, the all-time uh, best player that I that I've watched. He was the most dominant. He was the first one to ever have a game, high school game on TV. Lost one game in high school, NCAA championships. Came in the pros. He's got six rings. Okay, LeBron's outscoring. LeBron's first, Kareem second. Okay, but uh, and then they say, well, look, LeBron, he's fourth in assists. Well, Kareem's third in rebounding. They don't talk about that. He's the third all-time rebounder behind Russell and Wilt. If you just want to go numbers, mm. okay, and he mm. had five thousand assists. Okay, so I understand the different generations gonna go with what they have, and I'm not gonna knock LeBron. If I got to start in five. LeBron's going to, he's, you know, it's hard for me to say there. Yeah, LeBron's there. You know, I was always a Larry Bird and Dr. J at small forward. LeBron's exceeded them. You know, I, you know, I'm going to, you know, I got to give him that. He's exceeded those two guys as the best small forward. Okay. But, uh, but if I had just one guy and we just go go out here and make, and let's play a series, I don't think LeBron's going to be my first pick. Micaiah, what, 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 are, what are your thoughts? You, 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 you seem like you're <laughs> contemplating a lot over there. What, what do you think about this all-time debate? <laughs> LeBron taking this record has really kind of I, – I was more – I am I will be transparent. I am not a LeBron fan. Uh, I, I, I just – there's off-the-court stuff that I, on the court he is amazing. But when you view – like whether you like a player or not, you have to evaluate that off-the-court stuff. And he just has had some – he has done some good things, but th- there's just some stuff that he has said and done that I'm just I'm not a fan of the way he comports himself sometimes. Um, although I, that's kind of gone the way the dodo bird for me because I've just come to realize that all NBA players are kind of full of themselves. Um, as just sports fan, that's sports in general. You got to have some level of confidence. But I'm not the biggest LeBron fan. But I will say that this taking the scoring record. I think it makes it tricky. Like, uh, again, uh, I know Kareem had it before, and so we were like, well, why wasn't Kareem the GOAT, you know? I, I, why wasn't we talking about Kareem as being the GOAT? I mean, 
most most lists that I've said had Kareem at three before LeBron took him. So, I mean, Kareem's up there. Kareem top three, I think, prior to. So, I mean, Kareem has been in the discussion. It's just, it's boiled down to LeBron and Mike. Um, I really don't think this would be a debate if LeBron had one or two more championships and he only had one less than Michael because he would literally have all the two. two. Has LeBron only won three? Won four. four. He's one for yeah. So I'm saying if he had one more, he would one, only have one, one less than Michael. Oh, one more. Yeah, if he yeah. if he had one more, if he had one more ring, if he'd won one, he Mike had six. LeBron has four. If LeBron had won one more of those with the Heat, if he hadn't melted down against the Spurs that one year, if he'd won that year, LeBron would have five and Mike would have six. So are we really going to say that one more championship elevates you over this huge statistical accomplishment that LeBron has? If, but you keep using that word if, that little bitty word. What well, this is true. That, and that's why I, I led with it. I don't think this would be a debate if yeah, LeBron. Yeah, yeah, it's a debate title. because he has two less, less and because LeBron has lost more than he has won. Now, but if, if Mike had not sat out 94 and 95. Well, there you, there you go. So let's take it as it will. We'll get rid of the ifs. You're right. We got to we got to eliminate the if. It would be a different conversation. But that is part of it, too, that I, don't, I, I think if you're a Jordan fan that you're eliminating. The knock against Jordan is Jordan did not play to his potential in terms of time played. He sat out in the middle of that 3 P, and then he retired again, if I remember correctly, right? And then he came back with the Wizards. Yeah. So Mike had two separate times. He pulled himself out for one or two years, arguably in the middle of his prime. LeBron we can get to the nuance LeBron, LeBron of why he did that or – well, you can say, yeah, LeBron would never. I mean, he didn't because LeBron has longevity. Now you can say it's a different game. I know that's what the old heads are going to say. LeBron, Mike was getting beat up by the bad boy Pistons, and so, you know, he had to give his body some rest. It was a different era. It was a different idea. But I think if you also look at their mentality, LeBron has viewed his body as his temple and that this is his tool. Mike didn't do that. Mike was smoking cigars after the game, you know, boozing it up. Um, it was just a different era. Yeah, Mike sure. started to get in shape kick. He's the oh, one that first started taking it cool for basketball players to lift weights and work out all that. He, he did. Started. Especially he during did. that but, bad boys Pistons era when he knew he had to really bulk up to take that yeah. punishment. So I, I saw an interesting thing. The other thing that Mike does have is in terms of like the actual hardware, he has more defensive player of the year awards, I believe. Um I'm trying to think of the other stuff. Uh, obviously, he's going to have more finals MVPs, but that's because he's been to more finals uh, than or, – or he's won more finals. He's won more finals, um, which makes you the the MVP. Um, the, the, it's a no-win argument. Really. It's a no-win because – you know why? Because the NBA, more than any other sport, the eras are so different. It's yeah. like if we get into arguing, the mics go – why isn't Bill Russell the goal? He has freaking 11 rings. So why isn't Bill Russell the goal? Go. It's because, well, then you want to throw it away because it's like, well, he, all he competed was against was the Lakers and Wilt. So there was only two teams in that era. Okay, valid. Um, You know, you had then, why isn't Magic the go? Oh, because it's just him and the Celtics going at it. Why isn't Larry the go? It was just him going against the, him and Kareem. Why isn't Kareem? It's, it's, it's. There's like four or five different eras in the NBA where you could all argue that the guys from those eras were the GOAT of their era. It's so hard to actually like pick a GOAT. Now, I'm biased, and this is the way that basketball is now. I believe that the NBA competition and the level of the player is the best it's ever been. That's my personal conviction. The athlete today is at peak performance. They are bigger, stronger, faster, more physical. And I know you can't, when I say more physical, I'm not saying, oh, you can clobber them down the lane and not get calls for a foul. I'm talking about like able to take the the beating in terms of because of their actual like size, their actual physical physique, when I say physical. I'm not talking about like mean mugging and beat you up in the street, going to mug you. I'm talking about their physical physique, the way they look physical. The, today's since we since the LeBron, the LeBron era of player that has been the top line in terms of the player themselves bigger stronger faster jump higher now Mike had an insane vertical there's got been guys who've had insane verticals but the yeah. average NBA player is what I want to draw attention to the yeah. average yeah. NBA player is the best it's ever been and that's why I think you get LeBron as the go argument is because you want to say LeBron's average people that he's been playing against is higher than anyone has ever been playing against that this is just me playing devil's advocate i'm not saying necessarily agree or not the other thing is lebron has gone up against way 
more quality teams than anyone has ever before, I think. I know that sounds like – so here's here's yeah. what I say with that. The teams who, he's been in the finals, it's been more impressive. He beat, K, who, he beat KD. Who did Mike beat that was the world beater? The the, the Jazz? Was, was the Jazz the world beaters of his conference or, or of his era? LeBron went and beat the 16 Warriors, yeah. who are darn good without KD. Greatest regular season beat, team of all time. He beat – Dirk one year, right? Dirk and the Mavs, which I, I, I'll put... Or did he lose to Dirk and the he Mavs? Lost, I can't remember. Lost, no, he lost it. That, that was the one he lost. Time. Okay. Yeah, he, lost he, he did beat the Spurs, though, with Tim Duncan. And Tim yeah. Duncan's top five, right? Tim Duncan's top five, top ten? Top ten, top ten. Okay, right, so he beat the Spurs. He played in an era where he had to go against Kobe at the early offset of his career. So he played against Kobe and Shaq at the tail end. Now, I know Shaq was aging when LeBron came in. And then now, and then as he got older, he, he played against the other evolutions of the Warriors. He played against the Celtics, who I know were young at that time, but that was a complete team. That was a young, up-and-coming team. I, I'll put that aside. The teams that I mentioned, just let alone now, I want to know enough. who Mike went up against that are those quality of teams. Who is the who is the 2016 Warriors that Mike went up against? Who was the, you know, 10, 11, 12 Spurs that Mike went up against? That's and that's just me playing devil's argument because you you play who you play you play the era that you do but I think if LeBron has the argument it's longevity because that is an argument in and of itself it's look at how long my career has been I have been in the league almost going on twenty years that's insane in the NBA because of how physical and how much you have to and and exactly the man is going on forty years old and he's averaging almost to thirty points. And the man's going on 40 years old. So it's it's insane what he's been able to do. Longevity. The quality of the NBA, average NBA player is higher now. And that's an argument in and of itself. I just think it's one of those, we are in a lose-lose because Mr. Greco grew up watching Mike. He's always going to think it's Mike because he watched Mike up in close and personal. Wellington Kareem. and I watched, and, and Kareem too. Kareem too. Okay. I'll throw in all those guys. Magic, Kareem, Larry, Mike. All those guys before Wellington and I signed. Wellington and I grew up in the Kobe, LeBron, Steph era. And so it's always going to be – and then Mr. Greco, if we could find guys that are even, you know, older, they're going to – they would have said, oh, Wilt and Russell. And it's because those dudes were dominating when they watched. And so I just think we're in an era of whoever you watched when you grew up, to me, is going to be who the GOAT is. And it's just going to be hard for us to be objective and think – it's going to be one of those where – we're going to have to be 50 years removed from either of these guys playing, and that's going to be ultimately who decides who the GOAT is based on what they see in terms of career. Because we are still got people who are alive that watch Mike played, and until we age out of people who watch LeBron played, I don't think we're going to be able to be objective and, and take our emotions out of it of, oh, I watched the GOAT play, I watched Mike play, or, you know, oh, I watched LeBron dominate in his prime. It's just one of those where I don't think we will ever come to an agreement until – the two generations have moved out of the scene and someone who didn't watch either one of them get to decide. Cause I think you had that argument too with Montana and Brady for a while. Now you can say that Brady just did so much more than Montana, yeah. but for the longest time, people who watch Montana that were alive, nah, you can't me that. my dad's what still in that category. My dad still says that Montana is the best he ever played. And my dad watched Montana. Now my dad's a little biased. So I think that there's a little bit different there because Brady is just shattered. Brady yeah. has championship. Brady has Michael and George and, LeBron combined. combined. That's why you yeah. can't den- deny that to me that Brady is the GOAT because he has the rings, he has the achievements, and he has the longevity. So you can't argue with with Tom Brady. But that's oh. why we have the arguments with Jordan and LeBron because it's like, oh, Jordan's got the championships and he's got the hardware, but oh, LeBron's got the longevity and he's got the competition in his corner. It's just to me, there will never be any agreement until we're oh, both generations no, are off the no, scene. Yeah. yeah, there's no definitive argument. Uh, but you have to kind of just imagine them out on the court or what have you and watching them play. One of the things that says to me, even though I don't say Mike, Mike had an unbelievable attitude, okay? He was like, I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to beat you bad. You know, I want to embarrass you. Yeah. And Kill, he took it personally. Yeah, when he came on the court, he took it personally. Nope. Kobe, you my guy, but you're not going to beat me. LeBron, uh-uh. You know, he he had that, that particular – attitude cream just couldn't do nothing with period okay uh so you agree that's what makes it fun because of different eras of different generations and everybody can pull their points and pull their uh and, and defend their point and what have you which to me 
kind of makes makes it real fun. I still say differences in rules and styles. Okay, uh, you know, you're talking about these teams that you know how great they are. The eighty, you know, the, the, uh, what's that? Uh, Golden State and they won seventy and eighty games. Yeah, but would they have won seventy eighty games playing against some of these other folks? Okay, uh, are the players better now? Sure, they are. You know, more athletic, this, that, and yeah. Where back in the day, these were exceptions. These guys, all of them can do this, but do they know how to play basketball? Okay. Right. And this right. style of basketball that they're playing, that's what us old folks have a problem with. We see these skill sets and say, man, these kids would be great. But if they just played basketball, like basketball. Supposed to be played. Like, we really play, like it's yeah. how they used to play. Okay. Then we would like to see them. You know, can I put my hand on? You know, well, you know, you know, LeBron scoring thirty at forty years old. But look, how many? Everybody's scoring thirty. Donovan Mitchell guys. had almost had seventy, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, nine guys still. averaging over thirty points a game this year. Yeah. Okay. You got guys who are throwing up sixty pointers like there's nothing. Yeah. Come on, come on. And again, I, again, it's because the rules, not because these kids can't play defense. The rules don't allow you. Don't don't let you do that. You know, uh, nobody plays. You used to be in the, in the game. You were looking forward to matchups. Bird uh, again. You know, uh, the small forwards going against the other. The point guards going against. Now zones. Nobody plays anything each other. You know, you don't see LeBron. That's one reason I think there's a kid now. This Giannis kid down the road, he could potentially be in that conversation. Oh, he will he, be. He, he definitely he will be. He, definitely. He takes he will it upon be. himself that I'm great, and if you're the team guy that's hurting me, I'll go check Durant. I'll go check LeBron. I'll go to check him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, a lot. Mike would do that. Him and Scotty would argue. Or who? I'll go check so and so from Carl or whatever. Mm-hmm. LeBron doesn't do that on defense. LeBron's known for the swat and running somebody down, swatting the shot on defense. Help! Defense help defense! Down. Help defense! But guarding somebody straight out on the court. Oh my goodness! It just hurts my heart to watch him play defense now. Now I'm giving it to him because he's old, older. Okay. But I just can't stand to watch him on defense. He starts fussing at his teammates. Dude, you were supposed to have- <laughs> You were supposed to be over there. Why are you fussing at him? <laughs> That's you know, what Kyle Kuzma had. Kyle Kuzma had a problem with that one time. He's like, man, that was yeah. your defensive assignment, not mine. <laughs> the Browns not playing no, no, no defense, really. Right. Okay? But a lot of these guys don't have to play. And, yes, we know the physicality of the game. I hate that they took all that out of it. But it, it got insane. You know, it had gotten carried away. But, uh, I was gonna say but, you you can't you can't turn it into WWE Fight Club when you're coming down the lane. You yeah. can't have that in sports. That has no place in sports. No, no, no. But you also have the fact that this uh, isn't the Kurt Rambis era. It's, it's not a yeah, no. I understand you uh, all this technical fouls and all that for high school level and college level. But when you get to the pros, these are men, grown men, right? Men. And you as big as these grown men are, they're gonna be con. Basketball is a contact sport. For sure, people touch each other. Okay, it's not no sitting there. I got to sit there and I, I get too close to you. It's a foul because I got in the way of your jump shot. Come on, give me a break. Put the ball in the bucket. Man. <laughs> you know, it's just too, as an ex ref, I got disgusted with all Yeah, the I know as a ref, you watch it differently. <laughs> all the rules that we have to go through. You should, you should see these basketball books that you have to know. Mm. Get out here and referee. And it's even thicker since I left. Oh, it's two of those like that, but it's three books. <laughs> You know, you got three different books you got to master, okay? And uh, so I look at it like like that. So I appreciate the game. I love the game. I just hate how they turn it into entertainment rather than into competition. You know, they don't compete as much. It's, you don't get those one-on-one matchups no more. LeBron mm-hmm. versus Grant, you know, uh, the John Morant checking uh, uh, Steph Curry, things of that nature, you know? Uh, I don't think they give Steph Curry enough credit. Oh, as far no. as in, no, in the uh, upper echelon of players, yeah. okay? Uh, because Steph Curry, what he's doing is incredible. Yeah. You know, as, as it, a player, how he it, it, the game. Is Steph top 10 yet? He's on my top, uh, uh, on my, yeah, he's, I'm going to have him in my in top 10 yeah. because I got him in my top four backcourt. Yeah, okay, I, I got Mike and Magic at the first team, and then I've got uh, uh, Kobe and Steph as my second team all time backcourt. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I was just curious to see because a lot of people were saying, you know, he's on the fringe and then he won the championship last year. So it's it's hard because NBA is so competitive with all the players that we've seen. It's it's hard to make a top 10 because then you put Steph in. And it's like, well, who are you kicking out? 
<laughs> you gonna you gonna kick out Hakeem, uh, you know, or are you gonna kick out Will? Or are, you, or are you kicking out Shaq? Who are you kicking out? Yeah, and it's so really I mean, hard. The NBA is really hard to do a top ten for. What kind of style of ball you like? Like you mentioned earlier, uh, I don't particularly care for LeBron's style of ball. I give him credit for what he does and how accomplished he is. Okay, and his accomplishments, and he's a winner, and he's been to the finals ten times. I, I can respect all that. Okay. But as far as me, you know, picking my favorite player and or who I want to watch, you know, LeBron's not not the guy I want I want to watch. Okay, I'd rather watch Durant than I'd rather watch than LeBron. Okay, but who's been more accomplished? LeBron's been more accomplished than uh, than Durant. Okay, it's like in the old days, you know, uh, Will Chamberlain's a better player. You know, Bill Russell, you should look at as being the all time king, but Will Chamberlain was a better player. But who got the best accomplishments? Yeah, you know. Dude, my man got 11 rings. <laughs> well, this, Mr. Greco Makai has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you guys so much. I mean, we, we, could, we could do this like two, three hours when we talk. It, it, it just, just yeah, goes on and on. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> nah, but thank you guys so much for, for being on the first half of this, uh, of this episode. And we definitely got to do this again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Always a good time talking with you, my man. Definitely. Thanks, Wellington. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, and now we're getting to the second half of our topics, and I'm joined by a special guest, Jamil Davis, a good friend of the show. He's been on countless times in the past. Also, I'm a Florida State coordinator at Black Voters uh, Matter. Black Voters uh, Matters Fund. Thank you so much for being back on, bro. Bro, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, and um, I'm I'm excited for I'm excited for these albums. So let's get let's get to it. Yeah, man, absolutely. And just start off with our first album with Odysseys to Wet End. Um, in this new album, you know, there's a, a really a focus on the interrogation of the meaning and the value of the of the world around us. Um, external motivation and Odyssey, just talking about a, a career craft and a loving relationship. But uh, what are your thoughts on this album and just you know how Odyssey expressed the album's you know core themes of meaning and truth? Um, Odyssey, Odyssey is one of those artists that if you, Odyssey is one of those artists that if you don't. If you don't really know him, it's like you're really missing out. Is it you're really missing out on something great? Yeah. And you're really missing out on um a, a well-rounded artist who recognizes that I don't have to I don't have to chase I don't have to chase the trends. Mm-hmm. I can just create my own I can create my own lane. Yeah. I think he's one of those I think he's one of those artists that really thrives off of what we call grown man rap. Oh, for and sure. yeah. um and really consistently puts out puts out like great, great material right. every time. Yeah. So um it Odyssey never fails. Like when 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 you were like, yo, like we we reviewing the Odyssey album, I was like, oh great, okay, okay, great. <laughs> like I know I'm I know I'm gonna get some I know I'm gonna get some awesome. So let me go ahead and listen to this right quick. Yeah. And and see and see what he coming with and did not disappoint. Did not disappoint at all. It yeah. Really didn't because I feel as though like me and Savon talk about this a lot of people when the album don't hit the same because the artist doesn't stay with the theme throughout. Like to me he stayed with with the same theme throughout the entire project and then and then run from it. Like like did that stand out to you and and also like were there some other things that you kind of felt as though he just did so consistently that made this a great listen? Um, I think for me, like the 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 production on the album yeah. continues to be um the production on the album is incredible. Um and he continues to show just how thorough of a producer that he is as well like time and time again it's like it's 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 just effortless and then the 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 features on the album were were great too i really like the song with him with him and fonte on it the um, um, choices song yes yeah choices choices was awesome like choices is actually my favorite joint on on the on the album yeah and um we we literally did a throwback review of the listening um, like last week, Fonte is, mm-hmm. is just so underrated, man. Just he's, he's been yeah, Fonte, Fonte the most underrated MC in in the South, mm-hmm. and I and I really just feel like it's because it's because he's not the quintessential Southern rapper 
But if you really sit down and listen to what he's saying in his rhymes, it's it's really Southern living. Yeah. But brought from an intense lyrical perspective. Mm. And that's what makes, and that to me is what makes um that to me is what makes Fonte the best the the best rapper coming out of the South right now. For sure. Like, yeah. Definitely. Um and, and now getting into to, to Wally's the Sage is running from time. Um, in this EP, the rising multi talented artist depicts kind of the self struggle with wanting to escape the parameter within time itself in search for inner peace and also, you know, said in his press release, uh, 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 quote, though the, though the entirety of the project illustrates a journey to find the inner peace, there actually is no resolve by the end of the project, end quote. And I thought that was an interesting, you know, quote, uh, uh, really, really quote on it because he's like talking about you are addressing the subject of time, but there still is like no resolve at the end. And he really is kind of like going through. Um, the journey of it and what he's really trying to find as his inner purpose. But but what were your thoughts on this EP and what he kind of like got through on it? But isn't that always, but isn't that what the journey of life yeah, really is? Yeah, it kind of is though. It's just like going through, going through all of these things and then that, and going through all of these things and there's still like no resolve yeah. because every day you're learning, every day you're learning a new lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he did, he he did eloquently portray that with each song yeah. on the album. Um, Men Don't Cry is Men Don't Cry is, is a good one. Um, I think he really explored the he explored the vulnerability the vulnerability that's needed in hip hop really well. Mm-hmm. And um, this was actually my first time. This was actually my first time hearing Wale the Sage and. Um, he didn't like, yeah, he didn't disappoint. And I, and I'm looking forward to exploring more of his catalog as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and like this EPs are obviously something that's so important for an artist. Um, we, we talk about it a lot on the show just to like what the objective of an EP is like, 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 what do you look for in an EP? And like, like when, when you're, when you're being introduced to one and just kind of like what you're expecting from the artist to deliver kind of a, a short, concise amount of songs. Um, for me, the most part, for me, for the most part, EPs are like, for the most part, like five to five to seven songs. Like it, it can be more, but on average, it's like five to seven songs. And so with, with that, I'm looking for each song to have some sort of, some sort of definitive concept within each song. Yeah. Um, now if you, now if you're, if you're able to if you're able to take an EP and have a central concept for the entire EP mm-hmm. and then make sure that each song lines up with that concept, I think that um, that can put you in a place to where like you've just, you've just given us a great mission statement for who yeah. you are as an artist or a great mission statement for where you're trying to take, take your art into the the next era of your career um me me placing an ep me placing an ep out um in me placing the ep out in 20 2018 2019 yeah 2019 2019 which was the which was the greatest weapon the greatest weapon ep i literally used used those five songs to define where my art was going to go mm. in the next stage of my career, in the next stage of, of, of my hip hop career. Because right. the thing is, is that if you listen to, if you listen to my first album, and I was saying this to someone a few days ago, if you listen to my first album, Stand Your Ground on um, Driving Toward Our Purpose, it's literally the only, it's literally the only song of its kind Mm. on the album because most of the most of the lyrics on my first album was like they were they were lyric lyric driven obviously but they were very um it's very spiritual spiritual based and faith based Mm. and stand your ground was literally the only song on there that really drove home how I was as an activist and how I was as an organizer mm-hmm. with the greatest weapon. It put me in a place where 
I could literally, I could define how my music was going to go right. and what the mission statement was going to be for me as, um, as an organizer and at, as an organizer and essentially as a freedom fighter in um, this new fight that we have for, for black liberation. Mm -hmm. And so that's also the direction that my music music is going Mm -hmm. as, as well. And I tell everybody all the time, the reason I'm able to, the reason I'm able to still operate as a Christian while fighting this good fight of black liberation is because Jesus was the biggest revolutionary and the biggest black revolutionary that we had. So like, it's very, it's very easy. So, (laughs) you know, (laughs) yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, And and getting into our next review with with, uh, Bob's latest uh, song, uh, Diamonds, Um, in this new song, you know, he experiments with singing more in the track. It has a a dreamy sound, uh, hazy vocals that kind of, you know, help his, his lyrics about living out his dreams, which illuminate in a very strong way. And um, Uh Boz is another artist we talk about a lot. Um, Savon calls him the big fundamental. He, he's one that's a guy that's super consistent, doesn't get a lot of acclaim, but every yeah. project Boz has ever ever dropped, I've been a huge fan of. I, I love what he's doing. Obviously, he has a, a new co- album coming out um, um, soon. But what did you think about this this single that he put out and, and kind of just, you know, how he was experimenting, you know, with some different vocals? I wasn't... <sighs> I wasn't prepared for it. Yeah, because it, it wasn't what you were expecting. Because <laughs> yeah, upon first list, listen, I was like, I said, okay, he gon' he gonna rap in a minute. He gonna rap <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> it's like it's, it's coming, and then I was like, oh snap! Like, and even when he rapped, it still had like a melodic. It still had a melodic, melodic feel. feel to yep. it. And I was like, oh okay. So then I had to listen to it a couple of times for in order for me to like really get where he was going with the song. But but no, it was it was an enjoyable track. Like Dreamville don't Dreamville don't ever put out anything awful. Like there's there's never a garbage project or a garbage release to come out on on, on Dreamville. Everybody consistently dealt with it and um everybody consistently dealt with it and we always and they always make great moves. Yeah. Um with the with the art that they create. So yeah. Absolutely. Um and and, and now getting into our, 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 our next, this is, this is a throwback review, obviously, with, with, with Dilla's Donuts. Um, this album, you know, which is a, a certified classic and time capsule for all of hip hop, was one that, you know, is just a mon- monumental contribution of Jay Dilla to the evolution of hip hop and celebrates the musical memories he left behind. He left behind. Um, and, and looking at the backstory of this album, just how it was made, you know, it, with it, it was recorded in Dilla's hospital room using a 45 RPM record player and a Boss SP. A 303 sampler with 31 tracks um we all know february 7th as, as dilla day and this is just this is an album i mean every time if, if you want to be inspired by hip-hop and the, the just the the beat making process that this is one that everyone goes to but but what are your thoughts on this album mm-hmm. years later and just you know what it means for hip-hop let me make sure let me make sure that everybody understands this and i've i've said this I've said this on countless occasions and it it still rings rings true. Um every every one of your favorite producers that does that that all they do is lo-fi production mm-hmm. and they put out lo-fi beat tapes or they put out lo-fi playlists with just their production. Every last one of them is trying to recreate this album. Oh yeah, like they all are trying to recreate every last one of them. Like, like for me, for me, Jay Dilla is Jay Dilla organized noise. Jay Dilla organized noise. Kanye West, DJ Premier, and Just Blaze are the reason why I, why I make beats. Mm. All of them. They're the reason why I make beats. All of them, and. Um, I remember the very first time I heard Slum Village Players and I've I've spent most of my time as a producer trying to recreate the 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 clap snare that Dilla used on on players on on the Slum Village track players. Wow. I, like it's it's Donuts is Donuts is a beat tape that I can listen to all the way through. 
I never skip a track on that. I never skip a track on. And there. it's thirty-one songs. There's nothing you can skip. That's that's. 31. I don't think people realize how tough that is. <laughs> thirty-one and each of thirty-one and each of them on average is like a minute to a minute and a half. Yeah. As far as like the beats, but I guarantee you, every time you listen to it, you're gonna catch something different. You gonna catch something different in each track every time that you listen to it. Mm. I um so so until the backstory of the backstory of donuts is um jay dilla was suffering with a rare blood disease while also um being diagnosed with lupus Mm -hmm. and so the 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 rare blood disease kept having him in and out of the hospital while he was living in la because he actually him him in common him in common shared a house in LA. Uh, they they were roommates. They were roommates right up until um right up until his death. Hmm. Um because Common had initially met him met him in his Detroit home hmm. while they were working together on the Light Water for Chocolate album. Got and it. then he just consistently kept always having Dylan on his on his right, albums. Yeah. And so, um, somebody gave Dilla somebody gave Dilla a record player. Dilla at the time was kind of already messing with the SP three hundred three, um, and right there, literally in his hospital bed, he 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 made what he made the album that we're reviewing yeah, that right we're, now. We're talking about. And. Um, like I remember hearing stories from his mom about how um his hands would ache while he was tapping out tapping out the beats. And so he would take a break, she would massage his hands, he would drink some water, um, drink some water, eat a little bit, and then go right back mm. to 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 banging these beats out. Yeah. And um Literally two, literally all because because all of this kind of really coincides together. Literally two months before he died, he went on he went on this tour, went on went on this tour in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a video out on there's a video out on social media. There's a video out on YouTube of him in a wheelchair in Amsterdam performing wow. live wow. on stage with Frank and Dane, um during this tour. And the only time that he would come off tour is when he needed to go do dialysis. Like he would either find a hospital in the area that they would be in on tour to go do dialysis, or he would fly back to Detroit. I mean, fly back to LA to go do dialysis. Um, February February 7th is Dilla's birthday. Mm -hmm. And um, the album came out February 7th, 2006. And literally three days after the album came out on February tenth, two thousand six, that's when he died. Yeah. So he, so he, so he. If you listen to certain like vocal samples or things that are vocal things that he chopped up in the beats mm-hmm. on the on donuts, he knew he was he knew he was leaving. Wow. He knew he was leaving. Um, he he knew he was leaving. He he, um, Jada Kiss on um, Jada Kiss on the song Why at the very beginning of Why he's like, um, it's dead real, but the way Dilla chopped it up mm-hmm. on um on the donuts, he made it say it's death real. Oh, and there was like like it's certain like. Go back and listen. It's certain ways that he chopped up vocal samples in some of the beats that gave clues. The 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 beat um the beat that's on that on the on donuts called cry. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't stand to see Mm -hmm. you cry. And then the beat comes in. That's that's a beat that he made for his mom. And that's why the vocal sample is in. That's why that vocal sample is in that beat. Mm. Like he he was he was doing things 
like strategically him speaking to certain people through beats yeah. on that on that album um and a bunch of those beats on that and a bunch of those beats, beats on donuts have been used for other songs um even um, for the songs on other people's albums yeah i think even drake used it on the comeback season the, the time beat yeah i mean like yep. a lot of a lot of artists have used the used beats yeah the um the time of the heartbeat where he sampled jackson fives um all i do is think of you the roots the roots use that beat for their dilla tribute mm. on on one of their albums mm. um while he was still living, two of the beats, High, One for Ghost, and High, were used by Ghostface Killer on, on Fish Scale album. Um, the, the one that's called One for Ghost was the one that he initially did give the ghost for Whippy With a Strap, and then High was used for Beauty Jackson. Um, so Far to Go, was used for so far to go on um, Dilla's album The Shining, but also on um, Commons Finding Forever, Commons Finding Forever album. Mm-hmm. Uh, people have be, people have took people have took some of those beats on there and legit made songs with those with those beats. Um, I never, I never. And I and I said this on on Facebook, mm-hmm. um, and I feel like I might be the only person in the world that that does this. Um, I I doubt it though. I never start February every year. I never start February the seventh. I never listen to any other music on February the seventh without listening to Donuts first. Yeah. Like I literally what like I literally wake up, start my day, and then. If I get in the car and I know I'm gonna put some music on, the first thing I put on is donuts. Mm. If I wake up and I know I'm gonna, if I wake up and know I'm gonna put some music on, the first thing I put on is donuts. And then every February the seventh, I literally go somewhere, whether it be um, Krispy Kreme, Wawa, Dandies, whatever. I don't care. Like I literally go somewhere and I buy two donuts mm. every year. Every year on February seventh, I, I don't I I I don't break I don't break traditions. I do it every year. Like people can't. It's it's times people be looking for me, and you know they'll call me and they'll be like, "Yo, like where you at?" And I'm like, "Yo, like I'm I'm chilling right now, but I'm on my way somewhere to go grab. You don't I grab two donuts, yeah. and I don't eat the second one. I don't eat the second donut until like maybe." 12, 12 or one in the afternoon, because mm. the second, because the second donut is not for me. It's for dinner. Yeah, and um, like that's how I ce- that's how I celebrate February the seventh every year, because your your favorite your favorite producer. Name your favorite producer, and I guarantee you they're gonna tell you that their favorite producer was Jay Dilla. Yeah, it all goes back to him. Mm-hmm. It, it literally all. Every- it literally, Every time, it literally, all goes back to him. And, and, and it's interesting because this this past Sunday with the Grammys, they did a 50 year hip hop anniversary. Um, there were there were obviously a lot of things going on that night. Kendrick winning rap album of the year. Uh, mm-hmm. What were your thoughts on the hip hop anniversary and also Kendrick winning and just you know some maybe some other things in hip hop with certain awards that that kind of stood out to you? Um, they could have had more they, they as far as more. the 50 they could have done more man cash money was yeah more. like as far as the 50 year tribute it could have been some more it could have been some more Southern Cats up in there yeah. like it could have been some more Southern Cats in there I, I, I realized they had I really had Big Boy come in and do his verse from from the from the song AT Aliens mm-hmm. um but like the the South has had a chokehold dominance on on hip hop within like the last fifteen twenty years, sure. and and so if we gonna speak about fifty years of hip hop, like you gotta have you gotta have more Southern artists in there. I know I know New York is I know New York is the mecca. My my mission this year, with it being the fifty year the fiftieth anniversary of hip hop, is to take a trip literally to take a trip to to New York, 
and I'm gonna go to the Bronx and I'm gonna go to Sedgwick and see there and 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 just and just be there. Mm. Like it just 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 be there, just be in a place. That's my that's my mission this year. Like I did, that's my mission, and I'm sticking to it. Um, Cause I mean, it's the 50th anniversary of hip hop, and I'm like, I'm I'm a true, I truly embody the culture everywhere everywhere that I'm at. Um, in my organizing, in my music, just I mean, just who I am as a person. I just I embody the culture, and so that's like. It's 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 the equivalent of if it's the equivalent of if you're Muslim, if you're Muslim and you take a trip to Mecca, mm. it's the equivalent of if you're Christian and you take a trip to Jer- and you take a trip to Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, li- it's, it's literally the equivalent of that. Yeah. Like I, I feel like everybody who who truly embodies this culture and truly understands the true full five elements of the culture has got to go to the Bronx at least one time. And so that's like, that's where it originates. It the, that's where it all originates. I mean, it yeah. With it being the 50th anniversary of hip hop, like I have to, Yeah, like, so yeah. But, um, Kendrick winning best rap album was, that was dope to me. Like that, that was dope. I, thankfully, they, thankfully be, they didn't have a, a, um, a mess up like back in 2013 when Macklemore, <laughs> beat out yeah. a lot of better rap albums <laughs> yeah I appreciate I definitely appreciate that I, I actually was expecting I, I'm not gonna lie I actually was expecting Pusha to win it for us I was I, 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 I kinda and me and Tavon talking about this I felt there was a possibility that Pusha could've won because that mm-hmm. was obviously an album with Pharrell producing one half of it Kanye producing one half of it it kinda was yeah. like the perfect combination of 12 songs that he could have on an album Mm-hmm. And, and and I was like anticipating it, but when they called Kendra's name, I was like, "Oh, th- it's not it's it's not wrong though." But but and the other you, thing do you, is, do you view Mr. Morale as a classic album? I view it as a great album. Um, y'all probably have to come back to me within like three to five years time to to add to to ask that question if it's a classic or not. Um. Whether it's a classic or not, because um, I gave I gave Good Kid, Mad City two years before I was like, oh yeah, this is a classic album. Mm. I gave no, nah, I can't even say that. I can't even say that with um, "To Pimp a Butterfly." I literally said "To Pimp a Butterfly" was a classic the first day. I, <laughs> the first day I listened to that album, the day it dropped. I literally was like, "That's his most divisive <laughs> album." I mean, a lot of people feel <laughs> differently about it. So yeah, it's it's it, it, it takes some time. That album is classic. Yeah, and then there was the same people. So the so the day I listened to to Pimple Butterfly and I said it was a classic, a lot of people around me was like, mm, "Nah, bro, like you 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 have to fall back on that." I gave them five years after the album dropped. Mm. And then I put a post on Facebook and I was like, okay, five, five years after the Pimple Butterfly, can we say that this album was classic? And every last person who said to me, mm, you have to fall back on that one. They all was like, yep, it is. you're right. <laughs> and, he was, he was, and he was right that day. I yeah. was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, the record speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I, I literally feel like, I feel like Kendrick has, I feel like Kendrick has four solid classics in Four solid classic albums: the Section Eighty, Good Kid, Mad City, To Pimp a Butterfly, and Damn. And he probably got, and he probably got a, a another one with Mr. Morale. Yeah, like all four of them, stop. straight down, hands down. Yeah. How many does Drake and Cole have? <laughs> I know you, you were literally just mentioning this a few days ago because <laughs> we, we had this conversation on Facebook too. Um. um as much as people feel like Cole don't have a classic album, um, I, and I don't understand why, um, Forest Hills Drive is a classic album. Oh yeah, I definitely think so. For, Forest Hills is Forest Hills is a classic album. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that. I feel like legitimately that's 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 Cole's only classic album. Mm-hmm. And the the closest album, like the, literally. Literally, and I'll be fighting with myself some days as to whether or not I want to say this is a classic album or not. The closest that Drake has come to a classic album is Take Care. 
closest he done came to a classic album is 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 Take Care. Um, some people be wanting to say nothing was the same. I definitely am. I definitely am there. I definitely was like was the same as classic. I feel like it's a couple of hiccups on nothing was on nothing was the same. Like it's it's a, it's a couple of what are the, what are the, what are the hiccups of, to you? Um, don't think about too much. Too like you don't like too much. Sometimes that song oh, irritates me. No. <laughs> like that sounds very Man. that sounds very irritating to me. Uh, and there's some other ones. I gotta actually go back and I gotta actually go back and listen to it again. I think so far um, gone. And if you're reading this, is too, and now and obviously this is the thing with Drake. He's got a lot of classic mixtapes as well. So mm-hmm. far gone is a classic. I think if you're reading this, reading this is too late is a classic. Um, yeah. But albums like like you said, take care for sure. I think yeah. nothing was the same is a classic. Um, I know people are gonna call me crazy. I think views. I think views is. I think views is a classic. Views. I'm a big views. Views. Fan. I'm a big views. It's. Fan. It's, it's a I, bunch I, of. I, think, I, I know. I know. It's. It's a lengthy album, but I think yeah. it's the perfect mix of what Drake does as an artist. With the, he had the dance hall, he had the kind of melodic yeah. intro with "Keep the Family Close." And like then, it's a bunch of hiccups. It's a bunch of hiccups on views. It's, like it's a bunch of. Them. <laughs> it's, right. but he, go, he goes. He goes with the lengthy albums. Drake does go. He does go with like, yeah. with, the, with the quantity a lot of times. But like yeah, like so, be, because of the fact that so far gone was released retail, I give him so far gone. Yeah. Like as I, as as far as I, because even the album, like the album version, with without all of the mixtape joints off of it, the album version of so far gone is dope. Yeah. So so far gone, so far gone, and take care. Like might be his, might be his classics. Like legit might be his classics. Um, so he got two. Yeah, the one and a half. Um, <laughs> one and a half. <laughs> one and a half. Because because so, cause so far gone release retail was an EP. One and a half. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. You know. I but I, I never discredit. I never discredit Drake as. Having one of the best pins, oh, for sure. and 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 not even just hip hop, but in music, period. Yeah. Like the, the which, amount of songwriting he's done for other artists as well. I mean, he even mm-hmm. he even wrote um, Beyonce's "Heated" um, off of Renaissance. So I mean, I I think he's Alicia Keys as well. He, he he's contributed to so many different artists. Yeah, he could have made that which, his song, but he's going to give it to them. Which is why it'd be irritating me when. When the when the Quentin Miller situation yeah, always y'all comes gotta up, I'd be like, y'all gotta let that I'd be go. like, brother, like he he got a pen, yeah, he's got, he's like, got a pen, he got a pen though. Yeah, but yeah. So I mean, we're we're a day out of the Super Bowl halftime show with Rihanna. What do you what do you think about the set list? Like like, like you think any are there any certain artists you're expecting to see when, when when she when she goes through her whole catalog? Drake better hit the stage for work. Oh yeah, he better. Yeah. Drake better be on that stage for work. Yeah. I don't. I don't see any and, way she she goes performing work and not bringing him out. That would be wild. And not bring Drake out. <laughs> Drake better hit the stage for work yeah. for the Super Bowl halftime show. Yeah. Drake better hit the stage for work. Yeah. Um, you think she brings mean, the ASAP? Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's that's not a, a that's not a doubt. And with it being a Rock Nation event. Um, because run this well, town, right run this town has to get performed. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Ho- Hov and Kanye, Hov and Kanye coming out. You think she's gonna bring out Ye Hov too? Kanye. Hov and Kanye coming out. Oh. Hov and Hov and Kanye, Hov and Kanye coming out. Man. If you do, if you do run this town and you don't bring, I like and and y'all know how much I don't like Kanye West yeah. as a person. But if you do run this town and don't bring Kanye out, Hov and Kanye coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Hoven Ye coming out. Um, ASAP probably gonna come out. Drake definitely better come out. Yeah. And um, yeah. Hove might come out for Umbrella too. That too. Yeah, I, come, I think. Hove I might think come out for Umbrella for a Super Bowl audience, she is gonna do some of the Calvin Harris type songs, the pop hits at the beginning, mm-hmm. and then in the middle, really get into like the hits we yeah. know her for. So yeah, exactly. And. And the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> the Eagles prediction. We got a prediction from him. <laughs> yeah. And the Eagles, and the Eagles the first winning the Super half, Bowl. First half, our two guests both said the Chiefs. Jamil is going with the Eagles. So we, we, we got both sides <laughs> both sides picking. So, yeah. Eagles winning the Super Bowl, my guy. Yeah. I don't I don't know these people. Like, 
Jalen Jalen Hurts ain't Jalen Hurts not leaving. Like, not a ring. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know saying he he about to be Denzel. I'm leaving with something. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving with something. I'm leaving with something. Well, I'm leaving with something. Jamil, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, it. And, and so much. And thank you so much for doing this, bro. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate y'all, man. Appreciate y'all once again. And you know, all the all the listeners continue to listen to the podcast. It's it's, it's dope. And um, well, in Tennessee, one they be coming with it. So thank you so much, you bro. Know, as always, absolutely. Well, that wraps it up for today. I'm your host, Wednesday Burns. This has been a full scope. See you later.